This meeting will come to order. This is a special session of the Bloomington Common Council for the 9th of September, 2020. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Rallo? Here. Scambolari? Here. Rosenbarger? Here. Sims? Here. Bolin? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. Thank you. Uh, Flaherty? Here. Smith? Here. And Sandberg? Here. We have a quorum and everyone is present. Thank you. Uh, to summarize the agenda, uh, we will have approval of minutes. Um, for three different meetings from the uh, past 12 months, followed by legislation for first reading resolutions, including resolution 2013, a resolution proposing an ordinance to modify the Monroe County local income tax rate, allocate the additional revenues to economic development and cast votes in favor of the ordinance. And I anticipate there will be a motion to add uh, ordinance 2016 as an item under legislation for first reading. Uh, we will take up matters of council schedule and then we will adjourn. Uh, so that completes the summation of the agenda. Mr. President, uh, I move to add to the agenda under legislation for first reading ordinance 2016 to establish the state sustainable development non-reverting fund and to amend title two of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled administration and personnel adding chapter 2.35 entitled sustainable development fund advisory commission. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, I believe this motion is uh, debatable. Uh, if, uh, well, is, is it debatable, Mr. Lucas? Yes, I, it's debatable and it requires a simple majority to pass. Okay, uh, Mr. Flaherty, if you would uh, very briefly explain uh, your motion. Sure. Uh, yeah, this ordinance is um, directly related to the resolution we're considering tonight and next week. Uh, it's something that may have bearing on council members voting decisions with, with regard to the resolution 2013. So I think it's important that we consider the ordinance in the same time frame. Uh, the idea of introducing it tonight for first reading uh, is that we would be able to then um, have second reading and discussion and vote on the ordinance next week uh, in conjunction with, with the time frame scheduled for the resolution currently. Just to be clear though, uh, this, the, the, because this is an ordinance, you're only asking for first reading tonight and not to also discuss it tonight. Correct, only asking for first reading tonight. Uh, if the meeting went, you know, if, if members wanted to, I suppose we could um, uh, um, vote to suspend the rules to, get, to have discussion following the discussion of resolution 2013. Uh, but as this went out in the packet today, just based on the tight time frames of uh, resolution 2013 coming to us uh, last Friday and drafting this ordinance, um, it probably makes more sense to uh, give members of the public and council members um, time to sit with it and formulate questions uh, ahead of next week's meeting is my um, sort of hunch or preference, but you know, really up to uh, this body to decide that, I suppose. All right, thank you. Are there any questions on the procedural motion, uh, Council Borrello? Uh, just to check uh, if it adheres to public notice requirements to proceed this way, Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas, our uh, local code provides that uh, before voting on an ordinance, uh, it should be given two readings. Um, I think with Councilmember Flaherty's motion tonight, uh, tonight would serve as the first reading. I think his intent is then to uh, have it come back to the council next week without uh, committee discussion. Uh, for second reading. So it, it complies with our code's requirements for two readings. Um, it certainly doesn't follow our typical practice of release in a packet the Friday before a Wednesday meeting. Um, I think Council Member Flaherty mentioned that the, uh, um, that's a result of the, uh, the timeline for the resolution that the uh, administration has, uh, has requested. So um, I, I don't, I think we're complying with our own code. Um, and uh, the only Kind of hiccup I could see is that if a member thought it deserved committee consideration, uh, a council member could could move to refer this uh, item to uh, to a committee uh, if it 
if it is introduced later down in the agenda. Um, I don't believe um, that's a requirement. Um, so absent uh, a motion to refer this to some committee, I believe it's within the, uh, the authority of the council president to schedule this for next week's uh, meeting and place it on the agenda. Could I ask a follow-up of Councilmember Flaherty? Please, go ahead. Uh, would, would you be averse to having it heard by committee before adoption? In other words, um, delaying it another cycle? Uh, I guess in, personally, and, there, and, there, and you know, we can uh, discuss this when we get into the, the body of the ordinance um, uh, at some point. Uh, it's material to how I may vote on, on the resolution 2013. I think that may be true uh, for others too, just based on questions at the work session last week and uh, feedback from constituents. Uh, it go, it's material to a lot of um, issues that have been raised by members of the public, both in the spring when we first considered a local income tax proposal, as well as in recent weeks. Uh, so uh, while I'm not averse to a committee uh, hearing, I think the timing of, of considering this in conjunction with Resolution 2013 is um, uh, pretty essential, actually. I should point out procedurally that uh, there needs to be a second vote uh, because, of course, if we do amend the agenda to do it tonight, then uh, the typical vote uh, needs to occur for anything introduced to first reading. It needs a majority approval to be read. So we'll have to take uh, a roll call vote at that point as well. That may be moot if uh, this motion passes, but just to note that there is a kind of a redundant, uh, you know, we, we theoretically we could have just done this at first reading, but uh, Mr. Lucas, as I think correctly suggested, that we needed to address it with the uh, summation of the agenda. Any other questions about the motion? If not, uh, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion to amend the agenda to add Ordinance 2016. For first reading. Rollo? Yes. Yes. Scambaleri? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Is that everyone? Thank you. All right, uh, by 9-0 vote, we will amend the agenda to add Ordinance 2016 for first reading. Moving along to approval of minutes. Yes, Mr. President, I move that um, the minutes of September 25th, 2019 special session. The revised minutes of the October 2nd, 2019 regular session and the minutes of the September 2nd, 2020 regular session be approved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any comments or about the, the minutes? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Just to remind rather, you that uh, there call. was, just to remind you that there was a revision, a couple of small revisions to the minutes from October second, twenty nineteen, that was uh, sent out, I think, yesterday. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll on the minutes for approval? Councilmember Scambaleri. Yes. Yeah. Rosenbarger. Yes. Yeah. Sims. Yes. Bolin? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Abstain. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. All right, uh, those minutes are approved. We go now to legislation for first reading and resolutions. Mr. President, I move that resolution 2013 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will the clerk please call the roll on the motion to introduce res resolution 2013? Council member Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? 
Yes. Bolin? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Scambolari? Okay, uh, we have a 9-0 on that. Will the clerk please read by title and synopsis? Resolution 20-13, resolution proposing an ordinance to modify the Monroe County local income tax rate, allocate the additional revenues to economic development and cast votes in favor of the ordinance. The synopsis is resolution 20-13, proposes an ordinance to the Monroe County Local Incom Income Tax Council that would impose an economic development tax rate, EDIT. The Monroe County Local Income Tax Council is the body that must approve modifications to the local income tax, and it consists of four member fiscal bodies. One, the City of Bloomington Common Council. Two, the Monroe County Council. Three, the Town of Ellettsville Town Council. And four, the Town of Steinsville Town Council. This resolution would cast some percentage of the city of Bloomington's votes on the Monroe County Local Income Tax Council in favor of the ordinance modifying the local income tax to impose an EDIT depending on the votes of the individual members of the city of Bloomington Common Council. Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2013 be adopted. Second. A point of order. That, I'm sorry, yes. resolution, resolution 2013, be adopted. <laughs> okay, and we'll Thank correct you. our second, yes. <laughs> point, point of order, Mr. Thank President. Is, Ms. Is Flaherty. That, I just wanted to confirm that that's the proper motion given uh, your, your past um, discussion in our meeting last week that the intent is to consider this resolution over two meetings. Uh, we don't need any sort of you know, do pass recommendation or anything. I think we would just <clears throat> continue it. But is it the? I just wanted to make sure that we're. Um, we are currently in special session. Yes, this is correct. We are currently in special session. This is not a committee of the whole. Normally, resolutions can be passed in one meeting, but they do not have to be. More importantly, because this resolution involves effectively uh, money, the appropriation or raising of taxes, um, it had an advertising requirement. And uh, the soonest that it could be advertised, uh, the soonest that the advertised public meeting could be held was September 16th, which is a week from today. So uh, the council basically does not have the option to approve uh, this resolution tonight. And so the resolution, uh, I'll be, I mean, there's not even really uh, um, an obligation of us to vote on it tonight. At most, I think the appropriate uh, motion will be to uh, send it to second reading or move to postpone to uh, the 16th. But um, we can't legally adopt such a motion tonight, uh, whether we want to or not. I hope that clarifies things for everyone. Sure, but the motion to adopt is still the proper motion to make now, is that right? That's what I wanted to just double check. Uh, Mr. Lucas? I think the discussion tonight will center on whether or not to adopt the resolution. Um, I think the council should understand that they can actually uh, vote to adopt it tonight, but I don't think it's out of order to uh, to have that be the motion that's pending before the council with the understanding that the council is simply able to discuss it and not vote on that tonight. Right. Thank you. Okay. Do we, to... do we need to alter the motion? I, I see no reason to. I, I, it's um, again, um, it's discussion of the motion to adopt that, that will occur tonight um, with the understanding that um, a vote on that motion couldn't occur earlier than next, uh, next Wednesday. Very good. With that, um, I will uh, invite uh, Mayor Hamilton to discuss it. I do want to point out that uh, I do not have a timer available tonight on this meeting. Um, we are primarily discussing one subject. Um, I would ask uh, the mayor and every member of council to uh, be modest in their uh, in their bites of the apple, um, you know, because I think that this discussion is going to be significant, if not extensive. Uh, with that, Mr. Mayor, welcome. Thank you for being here, and please go ahead and uh, present Resolution 2013. Thank you, 
so you can hear me all right? I, I take your advice about modest presentation. Uh, I will, recognizing, however, that it's a major request, I do want to spend a little time talking to you about what we're proposing. Uh, and I want to thank you for, for holding this special session. Um, why are we here? What is the problem we are trying to address? We're here because city revenues do not match our needs, nor our challenges, nor our values. And like we did in 2016, when we acknowledged that revenues for public safety did not match our community's needs and expectations for well-trained, equipped, and funded public safety systems. And as this council then passed a 0.25% public safety local income tax. Today, our community is reeling from a pandemic and a resulting economic recession. We need to get help to our families who need to get jobs. We need to protect each other with a strong social safety net and to ensure that economic recovery forward is inclusive and just for everyone. We also need to address racial injustice that persists in Bloomington. We need to do our part responding to the climate emergency. These are all very big challenges and it's also important to mention that our basic government services are under stress. We expect to face significant revenue pressures in the coming two to four years as a result of the recession and of increased demands for service. Now, the positive news is that as we address these challenges, we will be creating the kind of community that matches our values and that will offer higher quality of life to everyone, and particularly to those in our community who struggle to meet their family needs and fulfill their family opportunities. More positive news is that we have already taken and are taking appropriate steps. Together, we've made very important investments over the past several years, and with Recover Forward Part One, for 2020 with $2 million being deployed as we speak toward these goals and with Recover Forward Part 2 embedded in the 2021 budget that we've outlined and proposed to you and we'll work on together in the coming weeks. Tonight is about Part 3, how we assure ongoing commitment to an investment in this progress to help Bloomington recover and thrive. I am here tonight to urge the City Council to support an Economic Development Local Income Tax, or ED Lit, increase of 0.25%. To generate about $4 million per year to address these challenges and help our families move ahead. We'll discuss the kinds of some of these best investments uh, shortly. But briefly on the how, we propose to create a new separate and discrete city fund into which ED lit revenues will flow and from which they will be appropriated annually. Uh, under state law, a capital plan is to be provided by the executive to guide expenditures. And I commit to you that we will work together to develop that plan annually with full and regular transparency and accountability to and input from our community. In a few minutes, I'll be presenting an outline of a potential plan, but it's critical to note that this is just a preliminary outline. It shows some of what is needed and what can be accomplished with this ED lit it also shows many things that cannot be achieved without it. But ahead of us is a lot of dialogue and collective planning to refine an actual plan after the ED lit is enacted. Now let's consider the when of the ED lit. As you know, to generate 
uh, additional local revenues, there are few choices besides a lit. Property taxes are determined by state formula with the prescribed growth in the levy each year beyond which we cannot go. Most other revenue sources are similarly uh, set by formula, such as the gas tax or, or state or federal appropriations. State legislature has basically allowed only the local option income tax uh, as how we can achieve needed revenues. They also, of course, established the lit council and very specific voting procedures to adopt the lit. Now, if, specifically, if the lit is in place before November 1, it becomes effective January 1 next year. We know the state legislature has indicated concern about even the current lit approach. In the past legislative session earlier this year, after we began discussing the lit, they changed the voting procedures in the legislature to limit the ability of cities with the majority of votes in their counties to enact a lit. Uh, and this provision expires in May, in May 2021, clearly indicating plans to adjust it again in the coming session. Now, some legislative proposals this past spring would have removed a city's ability to vote altogether. That is, it is not clear that the Lit Council and we will have authority effectively to enact this revenue after 1031. So who needs to act? To pass before October 31 or on October, by October 31, we need the city council to act by September 16 to allow the other jurisdictions of the Lit Council their statutory chance to weigh in vote, discuss, hear from the public, and so forth. So the full Lit Council, as established by state law, can review and act on the proposal uh, by the end of October. Now, two, two important asides. Uh, one, we are following the Lit rules established by the state legislature. It is important to note that for many years, municipalities have sought permission from the state legislature to enact municipal lits, our own lits. I want to repeat that. We have tried for many years to be allowed to enact municipal income taxes. The legislature has always denied that local authority and required countywide taxes. We absolutely will seek again this coming year that city authority and look forward to pursuing that with our county colleagues. And let me say clearly, tonight. If the state legislature finally does give municipalities that authority, and if other local jurisdictions decide they don't want the revenue after this ED lit is passed, if it is, I would and will advocate to rescind the ED lit and pass a city only lit. But let me be equally clear tonight that I do not believe we can let the city's future depend on the benevolence of the state legislature. By enacting the ED lit, we are protecting our future while also preserving, indeed perhaps supporting, the opportunity to work with the legislature to encourage additional flexibility. All that weighs in the timing of this lit. And a second aside is just this about the nature of the lit. It is a flat tax on household income reported to the state. We are not allowed to impose a progressive income tax. I'll share data about that in a moment, but again, the hand we are dealt is the option of a fixed local income tax. I will look forward to appealing to the legislature to encourage more just and appropriate progressive local tax options as well. But back to the main question and to conclude this introduction with the pr principles involved here. Budgets are our values and beyond the basic services we must assure, of course, public safety and infrastructure and regulation. Our budgets embody what we value for our community and our people. We in Bloomington invest in quality of life and we believe in opportunity 
for all. In these very challenging times, we must be counter cyclical. We must ensure that our community invests in economic justice so some people aren't left behind now or as we recover. We must invest in racial justice so we continue our progress to overcome the legacies and present realities of racial discrimination deep in our country's and this community's history. We must embrace the challenge of the climate emergency, understanding this is a collective responsibility requiring collective action, and that means us. We do all this knowing that as we invest in these values, we are investing in each other. We are investing in the better future for our community. And in all of this, our investments need to steer toward those most in need to assure the value of new revenues is an investment in the future of all of us. Now, I'm gonna to turn to share some visuals and some details. First, just briefly about tax capacity, and, and if you can go to the first slide. Increasing revenues always should be done only when it's needed to achieve important goals, and we should be sensitive to the overall tax rates. It's very important to note that we in this very progressive community have very low tax rates relative to our peers. Four charts. First, this chart shows the United States, our country's overall tax rate is very low compared to 35 member countries of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We are nearly at the bottom as a country in terms of our overall tax revenues as a share of our country. Next slide. Within that low tax country, our state of Indiana ranks 35th out of 50 of the states for the total tax state and local revenue as estimated here, trying to assess the overall aggregate tax load in each state. So in this very low tax country, we are in a quite low tax state. Third chart, even within this low tax state in a low tax country, uh, if you look at the 20 largest Indiana cities and rank them by the combined property and local income tax rates, we are nearly at the bottom of Bloomington of those 20 cities. Indianapolis is not included as a, as a, as a county integrated county, but we are nearly at the bottom of that. And just as a fourth chart uh, to remind us, looking directly at the lit tax, the local income tax, this is a chart of the 21 counties that are either touching us, contiguous to us or contiguous to them, the 21 region closest counties. Uh, the, lit the lit level for these counties, ours is 1.345%. There are two counties of those 21 that have lower taxes than we do in the green. There are uh, 18 other counties that have higher in the blue from 1.4 up to 1.99%, and in the orange, 2% and above lit tax. This proposal would take us to 1.595, which would mean two counties would turn green, lower than us, of this list, but one of those counties is presently proposing a 0.2%, which would take them back to blue uh, as, as higher than us. So, I just wanted to note that in this context, we, we are a very low tax jurisdiction. Um, now, many of us would strongly believe a progressive tax is better than a flat tax. Uh, I wanted to share what information we can gather about who pays the lit tax and how that burden is shared through our community. And there's one more chart that as best we can predict which is from Reedy Financial Group, and I, 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 it's hard to digest all of this, but I'll just point out a couple things. This is uh, the best uh, data we can get trying to uh, align who is gonna pay this income tax and how much will they pay. And you can see by income band on the left, this chart shows income groups of over 100,000 annual income between 75 and 100, between 50 and 75, between 25 and 50, or below 25,000. 
the number of households best we can tell by the data, the percent of households, and then the, the two columns uh, right in the middle of the page, the percent lit, lit revenue paid and the percent and the dollars. And I would just note, uh, while it is a flat tax and I wish we could do it otherwise, it's important to note that as best we can estimate, just over half of the total revenue collected from this lit tax will be paid by households earning $100,000 or more. Uh, those are about 18% of our households, but they will pay about a little over 50% of the, of the amount of revenue coming in. Conversely, the 56%, the bottom two tranches of the income groups below of 50,000 or below, those households earning 50,000 or below, which is most of our households, over 56%, will pay less than 20%, less, if it's a $4 million, it be less than $800,000 toward the lit. Making only the point that while it is a flat tax and it's not what we would like to do, it is important to note where the money is coming from. And it reminds us in particular, if we can be sure to push and invest that revenue that we get to support the low and moderate income households, uh, we can indeed multiply the impact, uh, even financially, to, to those households as we invest that compared to what is being paid. In. So I just wanted to share that, and that's from, from Reading Financial Group, best estimates we can get. Now, um, I'm very cautious that, of time, and I don't want to take too much time, but I want to note uh, there's a balance between sharing a potential plan with details versus simply recognizing the community input and the council input for whatever an ultimate plan is. But to propose some key investments to put into, to put our values into our budgets, I'm gonna outline a potential capital plan. And again, this, this notes what we can do with revenue and what we generally cannot do without the revenue. Uh, so if we begin with an overview slide, we've we've shared with you uh, a, a potential five-year draft capital plan. I put capital in quotes because the economic development lit is, is not dedicated to what we would call capital in our budgets, uh, but it's a plan to how to invest it. This is an overall chart, and I'm going to go through each of these categories quite quickly, but you've seen this five-year outline, uh, which shows more than we have revenue for of the kind of investments. And I'll, if, if we go to the next slide, I'll just summarize some of these. Some of these are going to be familiar from Recover Forward and others, others will be new. In terms of investing in lower energy use, lowering the energy cost for many of our households or smaller businesses with subsidies for ener energy conservation investments, uh, efficiency, uh, energy efficiency, insulation, appliances, solar, etc. Another category is to replace all of our streetlights with LED which would be a not insubstantial uh, movement to lower our carbon footprint uh, at about $300,000 a year. Two examples. Next slide uh, looks at improve investments to improve mobility options. Um, many of these have job impacts as well, but you've seen some of these uh, in Recover Forward already, sidewalk and path enhancements, annual investments, which do create jobs as well to invest in sidewalks in the places that need it most. Uh, a modest investment regularly to just improve accessibility to bus stops. Uh, you see a significant investment in the uh, transportation demand management program, a new program that will require new investments uh, to lower the reliance on single passenger automobiles. The next two are, are substantial sources to invest in the transportation plans outline of a high priority bicycle network. Uh, which will also help us match uh, federal and state money. Uh, and, and the last one, the master plan Greenway uh, outline of high priority trail projects uh, and the kind of annual revenue that would help us move those projects significantly forward. Also job creators. Uh, next slide. This is uh, a reference to uh, a number of items, uh, food and others that really focus on quality of life and, and for our people directly local agriculture support, uh, supporting the local farmers who have been working very hard and, and, and hit a lot of barriers, supporting, as you see, as we've talked about, extra Jack Hopkins funding. Uh, the social safety net is a huge part of our community. 
and this is a substantial investment in their future and their success, many of which are stressed. Uh, significant recovery grants for the arts community, including uh, what may be needed uh, for the Waldron uh, Art Center uh, operation, the digital equity, uh, the, the fire community care program that we've talked about that reaches out to people on the streets typically who have high medical needs. Uh, some other items on here would include the regular capital improvements needed in our parks to keep up with them, uh, significant urban forestry investments. You heard the other night from Lauren Travis about the importance of urban trees. Uh, and then we do list the possibility of a curbside composting program, a substantial investment to divert what is up to 40% of our waste stream that is compostable. Then the next slide, you've seen job support investments. This is continuing to try to help people get into the workplace who are not in it now or need better jobs, uh, different jobs, uh, re-entry jobs, uh, aligning with Centerstone for that wonderful program they do as well as Ivy Tech and the introduction of getting people into the growing life sciences uh, projects, uh, companies. And then a substantial investment that we can do directly for childcare support for low and moderate income households, knowing how significant the need for that is, it's at least a step in that direction. And the next slide, um, uh, two more, I think. Uh, you've seen this housing support on ownership to help those who are ready for a first time home purchase, uh, access our city's ownership uh, opportunities, either through down payment assistance or more substantial shared appreciation uh, assistance. Uh, we also uh, outlined the potential for $250,000 a year to support those who are either experiencing homelessness or at serious risk of homelessness to help uh, address that very serious challenge in our community. And I think the last uh, sub-slide here is focusing on some particular city government infrastructure needs um, you, some of you are aware of the telecom fund, which is on a continual downward slide. That has been the fund that we have used to support IT infrastructure upgrades. As that fund declines, uh, finding the way to uh, replace that is very challenging. This is one option. Uh, and second, facilities upgrades for our 24 buildings that we're responsible for. Uh, these would be envelope, a lot of energy efficiency uh, work to continue with our, with our buildings. And, the so next slide just wraps up uh, uh, kind of that summary again, and you can see uh, in those categories, uh, the amounts, uh, it's, it's easy to get more than $4 million a year of needs that are very important and outlined, um, reminding us that we're gonna have choices to make. And let me, let me just close. Um, these are critical investments from my perspective, and they are focused on lifting our whole community and meeting our challenges. They put our values into action and when, when people are struggling, when our whole community is struggling, some ask why seek these revenues? Because government is here to make our lives better, to invest these funds to improve lives, to build a better future, especially for those at risk to lower energy bills and save families cash every month while we're addressing climate change, to improve non-automobile mobility options, to eliminate the need for a car, to bolster our social safety net with more Jack Hopkins funds that will serve tens of thousands of needy neighbors, to help protect hundreds of people experiencing or at risk of homelessness, to help individuals who are struggling to get into the workplace or back into the workplace or to get a better paying job to support childcare for those low income working families, to help local farmers and local artists make a living, to help bridge the digital divide, to help first time home buyers actually buy a home, to plant hundreds of trees. This is government investing in our future. These are investments worth doing. If we do not pass the ED lit, we will not be able to do these things and things like them. We will face serious restrictions on our ability to meet basic services and help in the recovery. Some friends and colleagues in county government have indicated their opposition to this proposal. 
I respect their views uh, of their own needs. And of course, they will have flexibility of how to use any revenues that would come to them, whether to allocate them to other jurisdictions or strengthen reserves for tough times ahead or otherwise redistribute them. And we look forward to working together to convince the legislature to give all of us more flexibility. But for us, for Bloomington, in Bloomington, this is the choice to put our progressive values into action, to be counter-cyclical and to help recovery to include all of us and move us closer to economic and racial and climate justice. I strongly encourage your support for the ED Lit proposal and I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, I will just point out that I do not have a clock here. I'll try to keep one uh, on my screen, but I'll ask members to limit their questions to five minutes at a time, but uh, as many rounds as they feel they need. Uh, after two rounds, though, I'd like to go to the public, and then we'll come back for uh, more rounds of questions. Uh, with that, uh, is there anyone who has a question about Resolution 2013 for the mayor? Councilmember Piedmont Smith, followed by Councilmember Rello. Yes, I wanted to ask um, just a very basic uh, question, and that is at what uh, income point does a resident in the state of Indiana have to pay the local income tax? Like how much money do they have to look, earn before they have to pay it? Well, I do. we do have Reedy on the line. Um, uh, it is a flat tax uh, on, as far as I know, all income after your deductions and, and exemptions that everybody gets of a few thousand dollars typically. But I don't know if, um, if there's a tax expert or Michael uh, on, on the line wants to add, if anybody knows that. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. I, who is it that you'd like to have jump in? They may not be uh, able to... It's um, there. He's waving. Uh, Underwood. <laughs> Try Jeff Underwood. Try Jeff. Try Jeff. Try Jeff. Thank you. There you go. Hear me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The mayor's correct. Essentially, the it's the um, bottom end of the um, exemptions that you get for the state of Indiana. State of Indiana is taxed. They take the adjusted gross income tax from the federal. There are some uh, deductions from that, including um, any. Um, uh, deductions for uh, renters or property taxes, as well as exemptions. So uh, it would probably be, if, if I'm doing math in my head and if uh, uh, Reedy wants to jump on, they've got the total amount. It should be around um, $3,500. So anyone yeah. earning more than $3,500 would feel the impact of this additional debt? Correct. With an adjusted gross income of more than thirty. Yeah, that's assuming that they either rent or or have a, a home that gets them the maximum deduction, um, as well as they'd automatically get the standard deduction from that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Barallo. I think this is for Controller Underwood. Uh, Mr. Underwood, Recognizing what we experienced in 2008 uh, during the economic downturn, it, there was a lag period of effects. And I wondered if you could expound a little bit on revenue pressures anticipated for 21, 2021 and 2022, um, and what, what does my encompass? Uh, based on information that we have from the state, obviously they've already given us, as we presented in, in July, our property tax increase, uh, which was relatively good. Um, we think the pressures on that will begin to see in 22, 23, and 24. Uh, if you look at the 2008 downturn, there was some revenue decreases in nine, but most of them were fit, uh, felt in 10, 11, and 12. Uh, the state is telling us that they expect us to either be flat uh, uh, on the local income tax, which is the second highest revenue that we have for the general fund. Um, and they're still analyzing that, but from uh, early collections uh, analysis, uh, they're saying that they don't expect it to decrease, which is what 
uh, we proposed uh, in, in August with our budget. Obviously in 2020, uh, right now we're seeing experience uh, revenue drops in the gasoline tax, uh, in food and beverage and the parks and recreation. We would expect those to continue on um, for the next several years. We would expect that property taxes will either go flat or, or decline uh, beginning in 2022. You know, it's that balancing act of uh, how do we hit the cap, you know, how, how much are the caps going to go up, uh, which is one hit. And then uh, the levy is actually based on a seven year rolling average of non farm wages. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, as the economy drops, that's why there's that lag period is that you'll see that those bad years come on as some of the better years go off. We, and uh, for 2021, we dropped off the last bad year from the 2008 uh, recession. So um, I would expect you'll kind of see that gradual decline uh, unless we come out of this um, pandemic on a, a fairly uh, new uh, close basis and as well as the economy comes back as strong, so. Could we also experience uh, perhaps a decline in assessed value? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Bloomington and Monroe County has been uh, one of the uh, better communities for investment, and we've seen a growth in our AV. Uh, but essentially, that would drive up the tax rate um, if a AV goes down. It's one of those weird combinations of if your levy grows faster than um, the AV or ver vice versa. So if your AV stays the same and your budgets go up, you have a higher tax rate. If AV goes down and and your and your and your uh, expenses go up, then it's a higher rate. So it's kind of a seesaw effect. Okay. Uh, yeah. I had another question, but I can wait. Thanks. Sorry. That also makes the tax caps more threatening uh, as mm -hmm. that happens too. Right? You have another minute and a half, Mr. Rello. Oh, okay. I had a question about um, <laughs> if we had uh, this rate increase. Of 0.25 percent, where would we fall in terms of the 20 largest cities in Indiana? Would, would be would we be mid range? Well, that we we would move up a little in that. That was a list of lit and property tax rates. We might I think maybe went from 16 out of 20 to 12 or 13 or something like that. Uh, in our 21 county region, looking at just the lit, we would go from 19th out of 21 to 17th out of 21, though Owen County is proposing an increase which would take us back to 18th out of 21. So not okay. Not All right, one, one more quick one. Do you anticipate, I think you said it's submitting a capital improvement plan on an annual basis, is that, is that what we anticipate? I do, to revise it annually. And of course, every the appropriations would all be done annually uh, through, through whatever process we have, at least through the budget process and anything else we add. And you would you would uh, consult the council, absolutely, uh, in forming that plan. Great. Absolutely, thank you, thank Look you, Mary. Forward to figuring out how to do that best. Great. Thank you. Um, are there further questions, Councilmember Scambolari? Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. You, you actually spoke to this a little bit, but I believe Ms. Philippa Guthrie. Corporation Council is on the call as well, so I would invite her to um, comment. The, cap the language that I've read so far speaks about a capital improvement plan that must be adopted. And if I'm understanding correctly, it is the executive, that would be the mayor, who adopts this. Um, so it's not, just to clarify my understanding, it's not adopted by a council vote or anything. And again, I, I set aside for the moment Ordinance 2016 that's being proposed, but um, could you confirm my understanding on that? Yeah, I think, and Ms. Guthrie can add, but I think the state law provides that the executive uh, is responsible uh, to present a capital plan, to, to, to present a capital plan to the, um, I think the county auditor to, to release the funds. Uh, there must be a capital plan that allocates at least 75% of the, of the uh, revenue. Um, nothing stops an executive from deciding how to implement or how to develop that plan. It can be done collectively or in different ways. Uh, and, and as I put, I put quotes around it because it's, it, it covers a lot of different things that can be included that we wouldn't necessarily call capital. Uh, but it is responsibility of the executive to, to, uh, to provide that plan 
to the county fiscal entity that has to approve the transfer of the funds into the city account. Thank you. And Ms. Guthrie, did you want to add? Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, what the only other thing I'd say is, of course, none, no, no money gets spent without the city council appropriating it. That just puts right. it in. And, and I do understand that. I just, you know, none of us want to get to the nuclear option. We would rather influence the process up front uh, if we can. So again, this question is directed to Ms. Guthrie. Um, the different elements of the, that are proposed in the spreadsheet we looked at are, are shared as illustrative. Um, legally, what does that word mean? And how closely does the final version need to adhere to the draft that's been shared with us? Are there any parameters or guidelines for that? Or how different could it be, I guess, is my question. You're muted, Philippa. Lucas. Mr. Lucas, could you unmute Ms. Guthrie, please? Thank you. Uh, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, the, the capital plan is not adopted yet. It's adopted after you pass the lit, uh, and it has to be adopted uh, before you can receive your funds. So uh, if this were to pass, uh, we would adopt it by January 1st or soon thereafter, uh, because that's when the tax starts being collected. What was being presented tonight was an example of what the mayor envisions uh, being in it. Uh, but again, as he said, he would be work, we would be working with the council on what would be in it. So that is just examples, I would say, and the mayor can correct me if he would like to add to that. Um, but what's in the final one is, is something still to be determined. And just to put a finer point on this question, the use of the word adopt, um, a capital improvement plan is maybe influenced by council and I understand the ordinance that's pending as well today, but council does not vote on that plan, correct? Correct. It is, it is phrased as an executive function in the statute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Further questions from members? Uh, Councilmember Flaherty. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Mayor Hamilton. Uh, I have asked a question in, in the work session um, about property tax rate relief, and I see in our um, in, in the packet of materials that, that we actually have a 0 0.0518 uh, portion that is that is used for property tax relief. And I asked if it was possible to know what that um, looks like in other counties, um, just because the argument has been made that uh, it affects kind of the effective uh, local income tax rate. And perhaps also if, if uh, Controller Underwood could speak a little bit to the purpose of that in, in how we use it. Yeah, we, we did ask, and we have, I didn't include it tonight, but we have uh, some uh, statewide assessments of how many counties do use the local income tax for property tax relief. It's about half of all the counties in the state, I believe, and Mr. Underwood may be able to add some clarity about that. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, it's it, the, the county adopts it. Uh, and then it goes against, uh, it's based on AV assessed value. So it, they recalculate the rate um, of property tax relief. And um, it will vary by person by person. Uh, there's not kind of a standard uh, deduction kind of thing that you could say that it would impact because everybody's situation is different with the number of exemptions they get on property taxes, the property tax caps and so on. Thanks. I kind of meant in the like the the size of of the proportion or the proportion of the of the lit that might be dedicated to that purpose. I see ours is 0 0.0518, for instance. Like, so if we knew roughly um, what these other, this other half of counties that are doing this is it in a similar range? Um, is there a lot of variety there? Do we know that? Uh, we just got some some very gross numbers at the last minute, but so we'll 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 see what Reedy can pull together um, before the next meeting and send that out. We'll certainly share with you what we what we got from them, Council Member. We just sure. 
recently. And sorry, just one more follow up on that on that point. Um, if Controller Underwood is prepared to speak to it, uh, just just for my educa education, like, could you tell me why we have that rate and what it's used for? Uh, it, it's uh, it's for property tax relief. The actual you know um, property taxes that everybody pays. And I don't recall, we've had it for quite a long time uh, as far as, again, the, the, the tax council has to adopt that. And I think the county is the one that has proposed that in the past uh, to offset. So it, it may have even gone back to the initial implementation of the local income tax. This, the local income tax has gone through a lot of iterations over the years, uh, you know, when we first saw it come in in, I believe, the mid 70s. You know, at one point we had, you know, these were all separate income taxes, you, you had Kajit, you had uh, Lit, you had Coit. So it's now combined. So you have one, so that you can kind of do some apples to apples kind of comparisons across the state uh, because everybody did things a little bit differently, um, you know, enacted a different uh, category and a different rate. But my, my recollection is that may have been adopted and we'll find out uh, when the tax was first enacted. Okay, thank you. And yeah, it's interesting. It just strikes me as like a pretty inequitable uh, policy, but I, I, I lost sight of the timer, uh, President Volan. But I, if I have one more, if that's what we're kind of doing, is is using our time. You have another right? minute and a half. I'm still working on okay. getting it back up. Okay. Go Thank ahead. You. Yeah, uh, Mayor Hamilton, if you could speak just a little bit to what you envision um, public interaction looking with looking like uh, around, um, you know, uh, funding priorities and decision making. Would there be sort of public outreach and, and meetings where public give input? Would public members actually be involved in uh, some sort of advisory body or, or um, you know, um, decision-making uh, structure like that? Uh, if you could just talk a little bit more about that and what, what your vision is. Sure, um, and let me begin by saying, I'm, look, I'm really happy to explore that with all of you. Um, uh, we obviously have substantial public input uh, entities through many of the boards and commissions that we have. Um, first and foremost is the city council as the elected representatives who have the deepest familiarity with the budgets and the dynamics of the budgets and the balancing of all the needs that, that do should, I think, inform this kind of uh, uh, setting. But I'm really open to thinking about how best to do that. I, I do think the council is, um, at the center of this to think about how this matches and mixes uh, with the priorities of the budget overall uh, that we that we talk about. And I'm open to whether it's a, you know, the chairs of seven different commissions that are there, some new entity that, that involves with, with uh, input from the public. I think it's gonna be an annual discussion that will help lead into the uh, city budget process. So it should probably kind of happen in the first half of the year, if you will. Uh, to, to lead into the city budget building process, but uh, open to discuss how that best can be done practically. Thank you. I see uh, Council Member Smith and then Council Member Rosenberger. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hamilton for the presentation. So um, I'm not gonna try to rain on our parade too much. Um, but I've had some constituent questions that I thought would be good to, to ask at this point. Um, um, Jan writes, she's on fixed income, she's a senior, and she worries that um, it's gonna be harder for her and her friends that are on fixed incomes to, to deal with this increase. And so she asks, um, won't the uh, federal government uh, reimburse the city for some of these lost funds that, um, that it's going to happen during the, the revenue shortfalls? Well, it's a, it's a good question, certainly sensitive to that question. Um, I hope the federal government will do some things. There's no guarantee that they will. What they've done so far is mostly focused on actual direct uh, PPE and CARES Act expenses. Uh, we've otherwise figured out ways to to put uh, to put revenue and, and and assets that we have to work. Um, you know, I I think what I'd want to emphasize is that it is up to us to dedicate this this revenue, which I understand is is it's revenue that comes from our pockets all collectively, and 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 no doubt 
uh, we, need, we need to be very sensitive to that. Government needs to take action to protect the quality of life of people like Jan and many others. Um, for example, Area 10 Agency on Aging has a lot of programs that are really important and, and we need to do our part to help support those. We need to help get, get affordable senior living centers built, which we've been doing as a city to try to lower affordability costs. We need to improve mobility options so Jan or a senior may not need a car or a second car if it's a two-person household so that they can get by with much less cost. Uh, you know, we, we need to focus our investments in ways that will improve opportunity and quality of life for people. Look, it would, be, it would be different if Bloomington were at the top of the tax scale and we felt like we were a high tax place, but we are not. We are the opposite. We are a high aspiration community and high expectation community with low revenues. Uh, and in order to, to provide the kind of services, the programming through our parks department, the, the, the physical infrastructure that people want to see in the community, we have to have revenue to do that, to create that quality of life. Uh, and uh, another another one of my constituents asks, why can't the city pull in their, tighten their belt and uh, cut some services or some extras, whatever you want to call it, in order to help make up the shortfall? Well, we, we do tighten our belt. Uh, I think we've talked to you about the 2021 budget is a very tight budget. Uh, we've tried to restrict what we're doing. We're using reserves to protect from layoffs and other things. Um, look, we could tighten our belt by not doing that big list of things that I just shared with you. Uh, that would be tightening our belt from my perspective to say we're not going to fund a TDM program and we're not going to fund uh, Jack Hopkins in that way. And then those are things we could choose to do. I, I personally think that's the wrong thing for the, for the, um, for the government. I think it will diminish the future of our community and people in it. Uh, but we do need to continue to look, how do we, you know, we, we only added 1.6 FTEs when, when our population and our demands are going up way more than that as a percentage. We're trying to uh, restrict uh, investments that don't need to be done, but, on the other hand, I do think government's job is to invest in the right things that will help our community recover. And then I think I have one more. Um, if if uh, we have this divide now between the city and the county, um, so that seems that seems hard uh, in my mind. So is there, have we negotiated with um, the county about the local income tax at all, even since the, it was proposed um, at your state of the state on January 1st? Oh yeah, we've, we've been talking with them. I talked to some county members today and over the past week. Um, I, I do think it's important to remember that this countywide tax is being imposed only if a majority of the people of the county vote for it by their elected representatives. You know, most of the county residents are city residents, and so it is a, it is lined up as a democracy. The, those who represent most people are are voting to impose it or not. Um, we will continue. I have continued. I just talked even today to the president of the county council about. Uh, collaborating on uh, legislative changes and approaches. And of course, every day we work very closely with the county on many, many issues. Uh, but on this tax raising issue, they have a different take and I respect that. But I think we have to do what's right for our community. Uh, and then again, we can go to the legislature together and try to get the, get the kind of um, uh, local autonomy that I think we all would support. Thank you. I think my time's up, but thank you for those responses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. I'll take that opportunity to point out that I have managed to get the clock up on video. So I will be trying to limit everyone to five minutes, council members and members of the public included. Uh, Councilmember uh, Scambaluri, did I, did somebody else have their hand? Councilmember Rosenbarger? Somebody else may want to help. Councilmember Rosenbarger, I think was next, yeah. It makes no difference, but thank you. Thanks, Mayor, for your presentation. It was good to see some of the stats, especially uh, breaking down by income. That over 50% of the tax will come from people making over 100K. So that was really useful for me to see those numbers. Um, 
So I know this is a regressive tax and we talked about this a little bit before. That's something we can't change, but is there any way we can do something like offer a tax credit to households making something like under 40 K to give money back in some way? We looked at that. Uh, and so far as we can tell, we don't have any legal authority to rebate taxes like that. Um, the, the, we'll, we'll continue to explore what we can and Ms. Guthrie may want to weigh in, but I think that as we've discussed with various legal advisors in and out of government, the best we can do is dedicate the funding to uh, programs, resources that will flow uh, to serve the public, but a direct individual tax rebate is not something that we're allowed to do so far as I know. Okay, thank you. And one other question for now. I have received a lot of emails going both ways on this, as I think a lot of us have. Um, and a lot of these worry about transparency and accountability for the spending. Um, on the slide that showed over the year, like projected over the years, um, there were more projects, of course, than we can really fund with this money. So just sort of like looking at all those options. Can you go over in greater detail how you are planning to select which projects will get funded? Well, again, uh, that's something I'd like to talk with you all about uh, once we decide to have the tax is what process do you think is best? Um, I, I would, uh, I think we, we know that it has to be part of the budget process. Ultimately, we would like and are proposing to have a separate discrete new fund that is set up exclusively to receive money and appropriate money for this, uh, from this tax and for these purposes that will be very transparent um, and reporting. Happy to use existing commissions, um, uh, council interactions as you wish to see. We've talked about it in the budget advance or in a different approach. Uh, I'm trying to kind of stay flexible about that and think about different ways we can do it most effectively. Um, I think we want public input and public reaction. We want transparency and accountability, goals, reports, uh, those kinds of things uh, are really important to me overall. As you know, we report on hundreds of goals and, and, uh, and outcomes in our budget, and we would want to do the same with this. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Any other first round questions? Who, who has not yet asked a question? Because I'd like to take a crack at it if uh, you know, everyone else has asked a first round question. Um, Mr. Mayor, again, thank you for uh, your presentation, and uh, I uh, very much appreciate uh, the uh, leadership you're showing here. I know it's a difficult ask. Um, I think that one of the, um, the, the issues that uh, council members may have with the tax is uh, that you know, it's uh, not exactly like the council um, uh, has much uh, subtlety in their ability to change how it will be allocated. Um, to that end, I wonder, what would you say if we were to ask that you allocate all the money from the fund as a block to the council, which would then, uh, decide how to distribute it like it were Jack Hopkins money. Even though it wouldn't go to grant, it wouldn't go to grants to not for profits. Instead, it would be for the council to decide, uh, you know, that, that while the, um, the uh, administration could and should propose how it be used for money from this fund, that it be wholly the domain of the council to decide how it be spent. What would you say to that? Well, I welcome, I welcome suggestions and ideas. Um, I, I do think um, realistically that this, these funds, which we do want to target towards a number of potential uses, are inevitably integrated into the larger city budget and, and they have an impact on the city budget as a whole. Uh, and I think it, it's important that they be uh, f both from you and from the administration, which develops the budget and, and implements the budget uh, after you approve it, uh, that it be done in a, you know, in, a, in an integrated and intelligent way. Um, you know, we, we, uh, you, you, you 
allocate the money and we and we um, we administer it. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss it. I, I don't, you know, with PS Lit, for example, if you made that suggestion that the PS Lit money be separately appropriated from the other public safety funds, that would be a very complicated um, process. I mean, I think it's it's important for department heads. You know, they they bring budget presentations forward and suggestions into the office of the mayor and we have to integrate demands from very many different department heads and such and that's a that's a important and complicated process but i'm open to discussion uh, i just i just think it's 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 still within the responsibility of fashioning a coherent and effective overall budget and with with these special new funds to achieve new objectives that we agree on certainly well i mean uh, that's the thing is that uh, the council only has an ability to agree uh, broadly through a vote on the overall budget. Um, uh, if And I, I take your example to heart, the PS Lit uh, example, uh, you know, there's only two or three departments that get that money, some of it like dispatches off the top. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're right, in that case, it would not make sense. But here you're proposing a panoply of different programs and uh, some uh, members may think have more merit than others. And yet, uh, you know, as you saw with the last Recover Forward app board last month, uh, we are limited in our ability to uh, move dollars around. We can only cut dollars uh, in programs that we think aren't meritorious. And that's kind of a, a meat cleaver approach when scalpel is called for. So, um, you know, uh, because you're proposing a variety of different programs, it seems like members ought to have more uh, pinpoint control over some of those choices. What would you say to that? I, I didn't know if my lawyers wanted to speak. She's, I, I see her, so I don't know if I said anything that she wants to correct, but. but uh, uh, oh, I just wanted to make one comment. I, I think we would have to look at that suggestion because, um, it, it may undercut the statutory authority, which requires the mayor to adopt the, the capital plan. So, I mean, getting input into the capital plan is one thing, but saying, well, I don't need to do a capital plan. I'm just giving you this chunk of money and you decide. I'm not sure he could actually do that. So I would have to look at that. I'm not sure either, but and I appreciate that answer. Uh, but uh, I think it does indicate sort of one of the overarching concerns uh, uh, that the council may have. That's my time. We'll go now to a second round of questions from members. I see council members Rollo, Piedmont, Smith, and Scambaluri in that order, followed by council member Sims. Mr. Rollo, please go ahead. Thank you, President Volan. Mayor Hamilton, I want to uh, reiterate something that you said in your introduction, and uh, this is anticipating questions from the public who, uh, regarding what you recognize, what I recognize is an urgency of acting right now, uh, but the public would like to delay. And this really may je jeopardize our ability to act. Is, is that, am I correct? Y yes, look, I, I um... These are complicated times. Um, uh, I, I very much wish that we had the local authority to decide a city tax and to decide a progressive city tax when we wanted to put it in place. And if that were the land that we lived in, we would probably be having a very different discussion right now. That is not the land we live in. And I have to say that um, I think if we are trying to protect our city's future, the best thing we can do is to put this tax in place and then go to the legislature in the spring, in January, February, even before then, to say, look, this isn't the way we wanted to do it. This is the way we had to do it. Why don't you let the city of Bloomington enact our own income tax and we will adjust it, we'll change it. Um, if we don't have that position, however, I'm quite concerned that we may not have that authority to act in the future. I can't know that, um, I, I just know based on some of the legislation that was proposed last session, earlier this spring, they actually, the, the state legislature could take significant action to diminish the city's chance to chart our own future that way. 
All right, thank you. Uh, Council for Piedmont Smith. Yes, I wanted to ask um, if uh, this increase in the lit passes this fall, uh, and if the uh, state legislature decides to um, give all of the power over the lit to the county government, mm -hmm. could the county government rescind the lit increase that was passed this fall? Well, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's difficult to rescind a tax that's put into place, but I, uh, it, particularly if we have um, relied upon the tax to do significant programs, um, uh, that you're, you're proposing some actions that I, 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 I can't say anything's impossible, but um, uh, I don't think that that would, that would generally be a problem around the state if new entities could repeal taxes that other entities have put in place, but they're very creative. I'm not sure you're, you're, you're thinking creatively, uh, which, which is probably smart to, to do. I don't know if anybody has a view on that, but we can, we can think about that some more. I still think we just have to do the best that we can for, for our people and our future, uh, and, and trust that we can go, uh, maybe, maybe create some more flexibility for the future at the, at the legislature. Okay, um, and I have another question, if I may. Um, and this is to follow up what Councilmember Flaherty was asking about with the property tax relief. So I'm sorry, I'm a lay person when it comes to taxes. Um, so Mr. Underwood may have to go into greater depth. So uh, it looks like there's 0.0518% of our current lit goes to property tax relief. What does that actually mean? Does that mean that we refund property taxes for some people in Monroe County uh, out of our lit revenues? Yes. That's crazy. Sorry. Well, it uh, was, <laughs> I think just again, I'm, I'm going off memory here and we'll, we'll verify before the next meeting and get, get you a little bit more background on, on property tax relief. Uh, was it was the negotiation for the, you know, the ability for uh, local units of government to enact a local income tax uh, was that some of that could be allocated to property tax relief for that very reason. And the fact, um, you know, we have a large council, you have county council, city council, Ellisville Town Council and Sinesville is that this would allow for some relief on property taxes. I believe it can the max it can be is, is capped at 1.25%. I'm going to double check. I was doing some Googling while you guys were talking, but it looks like the cap on that's 1.25%. So we're below the maximum. But who decides how much of our lit revenues go towards property tax relief? I believe that gets adopted by the county, but I'll, I'll, it'll either be the county or the, uh, the county fiscal body or the, um, the tax council. Okay. I, I let me be, to, let me be clear, I'm not here advocating in favor of that. I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> the questions, but- uh, It's I kind of tangential, but it's just- No, I get it, but it's a, it's a fair question. I, I don't think it's on the table right now, but maybe it ought to be in the future. I think that's a fair question. Okay. Well, Mr. Underwood, I can get that information from well, you later yeah. on then. Thank yes. you. It, Thank you. I, I'm interested in the answer to that too. I will. <laughs> okay. Uh, next would be Councilmember Scambaluri, followed by Councilmember Sims. Thank you. Um, two questions. One of one of the themes kind of running through this conversation is the notion of uncertainty in the legislature in, um, in how quickly our recovery will go. And I agree, I think that's kind of a factor that's influencing our thinking on passing a lit right now. Um, has any thought, and I asked this in the work session on Friday, has any thought been given to building in a sunset date? Have there been any further conversations or is that not something we're interested in doing? Uh, we I appreciate the question. We we have been talking and thinking about it. Uh, I think the short answer is I'm not sure that 
we can. Uh, I certainly welcome, and I think it's appropriate to review and for any future council to review the, the income tax uh, to see its uses and impact. And it's, I don't have any problem with saying we ought to review it at five years. I, I don't know of a legal way to put a sunset in. Um, uh, it, certainly if you, if you do any bonding against it, that of course gets, gets uh, different. But um, I, I think what I would suggest is that we very consciously and intentionally say, are we getting the bang for our buck out of this that we, that we want to? Um, I mean, we should do that with BS lit. Uh, we should do it with ED lit. Uh, and actually, with every dollar that we appropriate, are we getting what we want out of it? Thank you. Um, and something I'm just curious about when we first were introduced to the idea of an increase in the lit, um, back in your remarks on January 1st, one of the biggest elements was transit. And I think, and I know that perhaps several of us found that very, very compelling and exciting to think about. Um, and transit is kind of the biggest chunk taken out of this revised proposal. I'd just be interested in the thinking and the sure. conversation process that brought you to that. Ab absolutely. Well, you're right. Actually, the, the 0.5 that, that I talked about in January was meant to be roughly 0.25 for transit and 0.25 for everything else. Um, Frankly, what we have today is the 0.25 for everything else um, for a couple reasons. One, the main one is transit, well, it's a couple reasons. The main one is transit is in such uncertain times and tumultuous um, operations right now that it's very difficult to know how it should and could be enhanced. Um, it did get about $8 million to reference the federal money, which can help back to Council Member Smith. It, count, it did get about $8 million of direct federal money to transit, which is really important to help them get through this. Um, the, the other reason I would say that is I think there is a lot of support for a transit supporting income tax down the road that would be adopted by everybody, I think, to support transit. So I don't I think there's not an emergency need for that because they're very uncertain operations right now and they have the federal money to get them through what they need to get through. And when time comes, I'm less worried that we'll all be able to come together and support a new transit support. So, uh, and, and also that the 0.25 tax is much less onerous than a 0.5% tax on everybody in these difficult times. And, and I, I guess what I'm wondering though is why is transit and its future more uncertain than anything else. It seems like everything is uncertain, at some degree of uncertainty, and everything merits our attention in terms of recovering forward and positioning ourselves for what the next era of transit might look like in Bloomington. Um, well, why is transit different, I guess is my question. I guess, I mean, it's a good, it's Does a good- question make sense? I, yeah, I, I, I'll try to answer, I mean, transit, the volume is way down. They don't need to run more service in the way they might have with where they had routes that were overcrowded. It's unclear what the demand is going to be for transit. There are certainly important ways to think about its changes. I guess when I think about recover forward and really trying to help our community right now, we, the most important things seem to me the kind of lists that we're looking at that are creating jobs, that are helping people get jobs, that are helping the social safety net that are helping farmers and 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 uh, artists that are that are really struggling right now. Our transit system is actually kind of meeting the needs that are out there. They're in a way running buses that are emptier than they typically have been. So it, it's a, it's just a very different system uh, need right now from my perspective. But okay, that's all. Thank we you. are investing some in transit, as you know, to help their right. infrastructure and accessibility, but but not nearly. I think there is a good, a good reason to think about that down the road as another uh, level of investment. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sims. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Hamilton, for the report. Um, and will we get a copy of those slides that that was part of your presentation? Uh, we normally do, so I'd like. Yeah. Thank you, and I'd, I'd like to have that. Um, and also. In addition to thanking you, I'd like to thank um, our public because I think many of us have received um, comments, input, um, some in opposition and some in support. Um, so I think that's important um, for the public to participate. Um, 
have a comment. I'm going to try to form it in a question. I don't quite know how it's going to sound at this point. Uh, but we've talked about the potential impact of lit. Um, but one of the things that I'm not hearing yet from a more um, open, a more transparent position is that looming, and I do believe this is within next calendar year, um, a rate increase from utilities. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. And I think we're also looking at increases from our township government with regard to the fire protection districts. And I don't think we've kind of formulated that so that it gives you a more fuller picture uh, of these investment and impacts um, on folks, you know, in particular in the city. So I don't know how you could do that. I don't know if that's even possible. Um, but I think that would be a clearer picture um, on the impacts, um, at least in my way of thinking, and particularly with some of our um, um, lower income folks. Um, there was talk, I think it was in the work session, um, that there was a mechanism that instead of the, the lit starting on January 1st, I thought there was a mechanism that it could possibly, we could wait a little while, do some uh, the same process but the, the lit tax would start in October 1st. Did I miss hear that? Um, and, and I'm not so much advocating that. And I also know that that will be a net loss of $3 million roughly, um, which don't do a lot with for right now, but we'd get 1 million as opposed to the 4 million. Um, but I also, I'm wondering if more time, which is some of the, the letters in opposition that I'm hearing, um, how would that affect where moving forward? Um, and I know it's not something that, that's being advocated at this point, um, but what are your thoughts on that as far as waiting with that process, knowing that we'll lose some of that revenue? Sure. Um, and, and let me go back to your first uh, questions about, uh, first of the, the township fire district uh, fee changes would apply to people in the townships outside city limits. So far as I know, they're not changing the fire protection costs for those who are inside city limits. Um, but it would just be for those township services and members who are outside city limits getting change in, in their fire protection that their their rates could change, but not city residents. Um, on the on thank the, you on the rate increase for the water, we, we have I have asked CBU to be more consistent and regular and absolutely transparent uh, about more regular four-year cycles on, on reviewing the rates. Of course, we were subject to Utility Regulatory Commission and, and many of those, you know that, you've been on the commission, but it's, it's yes. fair. That I, I have asked the City of Bloomington Utilities to be more transparent and regular about the timing of those, of those things. Um, so there is one plan. We actually pushed it off because of the recession and the hits this year into next year to try to, to try to ameliorate that. Um, on the timing of the tax, so yes, under state law, if, uh, if the lid is not imposed uh, before November 1st, if, it's, if it, the vote is effective after November 1st, the tax is not collected until late the following year. So in this circumstance, late 2021. Uh, and, and in some ways that may be reasonable and, and seem appealing. My concern very directly is that if we took that path, I believe it's quite possible the legislature could um, uh, override that uh, in the meantime. The state legislature could choose to change how a tax gets imposed. It would not be being collected yet. Uh, I'm, I'm highly expected that they could say, well, this tax has been voted on, but we're going to change the way you have to impose this tax. It hasn't been collected yet so we can step in and, and do that. So that's the main concern I have is that we would be depending upon the actions of the state legislature, which um, I, I would rather go and talk to them with the tax in place so that we can discuss how to adjust it in ways that we think would give the city more uh, independence rather than go and hope that they don't change uh, something that they could very well change, just like they did this year. When we announced the plan to do the tax, they immediately quickly uh, change the way the tax is put in place to make it more difficult to do so. Thank you. Further second round questions from members. Anyone who has not asked a second round question? 
Going once, going twice. All right, we are at the end of the second round of questions. Uh, I'd like to go to the public for comment on resolution 2013. Uh, I will ask people to keep to five minutes. Um, I uh, had a couple of people raise hands uh, early, so I'd like uh, to call on uh, Tyler Kane and then Randy Paul to speak first. Uh, if if uh, the clerk would unmute uh, Tyler Kane if he's still on the call. I am attempting to find them on the list. If they are not there, then we will move on to Mr. Paul. I do not see Tyler Kane. If they could raise their hand. Uh, they, they, I think they may have dropped off the call. Okay, so uh, let's um, continue on to Mr. Randy Paul. Randy Paul is unmuted. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? Yes, please think, go ahead. I don't think I've ever spoke first on one of these things. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I don't question really anybody's motive, whether they're for or against this. I think everybody comes to it with a with the best of intentions. My concern is I think decision makers oftentimes look at taxes through the lens of their own personal experiences and usually it's usually middle income or upper income or wealthy perspective. And I honestly believe that unless you have been in a position of being in poverty, you never really understand uh, the hardship and the, the challenges that they face on a daily basis. And I think that while I respect Mayor Hamilton's discussion of values. I think there are many people, myself included, who do not consider values being budgeting or balancing budgets on the back of the poor. And while that chart, that chart shows that lower income people pay a less percent, they don't live in a vacuum. They pay a higher percent of their income in food costs, in housing, in health care, child care. They're not making it now. And this pandemic has made it even worse for them. And so I think when I hear things like, you know, they're, this is an equitable tax because they're paying less. They can't afford to pay anything more. And usually the response I get from that is, well, the offsets on this tax will help them as far as weatherization and transportation. That's fine, but bills come in monthly and offsets come in months and years. And it just won't come fast enough to help the people that are really hurting right now. And so I think to Ron Smith's comments, I think there's a real danger you're going to have, this community has enough friction going on as, and disagreements. I think if this council somehow imposes a tax on the county and the people of low income in the county are going to have to experience this without having a direct voice, I think you're going to have even more um, division and strife within our community. If you're talking about a community that includes the county, if you're talking about community and only talking about Bloomington, I think you're looking at problems down the road. I would hope that we would delay this um, and focus on the people who can least afford it versus focusing on the people who can't afford it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, who is next who'd like to speak? Ms. McDowell? Next is, I believe, Ilana Stonebreaker, and they are unmuted. Awesome. Thank Please you. go ahead. Mm -hmm. oh. Um, so once again, my name is Alana Stonebreaker. I've been to a couple of the meetings about both the previous mayor's tax uh, at 0.5% and just as background, um, I was on the Tippecanoe County Council previously and I have passed a public safety lit. So I have been through some of the aspects of this problem before. I moved here in January and I was initially really excited when I heard about the sustainability tax, um, but then really troubled because I didn't really see a plan and I gave a public comment in March, just concerned and frustrated that we didn't really have like an idea for how the mechanisms were working. And I feel like now, you know, not even two weeks from possibly adopting the tax, we still don't have answers to many important questions, such as why is it an economic development lit and not um, a certified shares, right? Um, that would give other um, parts such as libraries uh, share of that in addition to city government. Um, 
I also am worried that the mayor hasn't presented a specific problem and then a solution that is that is solved with this tax if besides the problem that there's not enough money. Um, I understand that need, um, but I think that the economic development tax is not necessarily the best mechanism for dealing with that particular problem. Um, and I know since I don't see a definite problem, I also don't see a definite solution here. We've been having conversations, major, major implementation ideas coming out from allocating all the money to the city council to allocating it to this, um, the, the proposed 216, which also includes um, a potential additional board with kind of not clear ideas on how um, we'll keep that group transparent and accountable. And down to the idea of that um, all the proposed projects seem to be somewhat theoretical, right? Um, and I think I'm really troubled by um, the mayor's comment that if we don't get, if we don't uh, fund this tax, that we won't fund these projects that we've already agreed as a community are important to us as a community. So I think if there are projects that are important to us and there are things that are important to us like sustainability, I think it's really important that we bring that to the table with other things um, and really have that conversation as a community and not just put out new things that we're passionate about and then say we can't have those things unless we add this additional tax. Um, just as a final thing, um, I've talked to a couple of different people, both in the city and the county. Um, I think we've got some great public officials here and I look forward to having a longer conversation about this tax in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Who is next? Who wishes to speak? Madam Clerk. Next is uh, Greg Alexander and they are unmuted. Hi, You'll have five minutes, sir. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Greg Alexander. Um, I totally agree with uh, the last comment. Um, I wanted to read, uh, well, this is a paraphrase actually because there's most too long, but uh, this is a bullet point from the letter from the County Council. Um, they said, uh, during uncertain times, it would be unwise to increase the tax burden without a manifest plan for its use. And um, the first half of that statement, I, I, I simply don't see any merit to it. I remember the 2008 recession. I kept my job and people who kept their job through the 2008 recession, they're the people who continued to pay income tax and they were not facing the biggest struggles at that time. Um, I hope to keep my job this time. I'm not facing the biggest struggles uh, of this, um, certainly not economically anyways. Uh, and so I don't think the uncertainty of the time really matters one bit or another. Um, the, the people who are really hurting are gonna be losing their income and they're not gonna be paying as much tax because of that. Um, on the other hand, the second half of that though, I, I just, I couldn't agree more strongly with, we need a, a, a manifest plan for its use. If we're gonna be raising taxes, even a, a very small cost for people who don't have much income, we owe them a this that explains how it's gonna benefit them. And I think transit is just such a, a real low hanging fruit there because there's almost no other way to fund transit that I know of anyways, that, that we have a local uh, impact on. And it really does make an immediate difference in the lives of people who don't have any money. Like people will not immediately go out and sell their car, but one day their car will break down and they'll be like, oh, I only have to wait 15 minutes for the bus. And that's an experience that a low income person really has. When their car breaks down, they really do immediately go to the bus. Whereas somebody with a little bit more money, they go for a, a you know, they borrow a car from someone or they, they rent one. And we just need to have a better bus system. If you go on the buses that are not full of students, they are full of visibly low income people. Um, and if you see like a low income person, if their kid, their 16 year old kid doesn't get a car the moment they turn 16, you know, they ride the bus. My friends that lived out on like a Corey Lane, very low income family, he rode the bus. You know, it's, it's just such a, a no brainer that, that if you want to actually help people, we got to ride the bus. But anyways, we definitely have to have a plan that is a little bit uh, more specific than composting. You know, um, and I want to I want to draw attention to um, you know sidewalks really need money, but they're they're pure capital, um, and I think there are other ways to fund that. I think you could probably use TIF or bonding or different different ways to pay for sidewalks. But another thing, bicycle infrastructure got got referenced, and I mean I, I really am excited to see some funding for bicycle infrastructure, but it doesn't. The thing bicycle infrastructure needs the most is the political willpower 
to reduce automobile speeds. If we have that willpower, it only costs 10 or $20,000 per intersection to install low cost, uh, low delay. We could install it all next over the next year. Bump outs and ways to slow cars down at intersections and to slow cars down the middle of the street. A uh, protected bike lane does not need to be like, I love what they did on Adam Street between Kirkwood and Third Street, but it does not need to be that complicated. It does not need to be that expensive. We need the political willpower and we need to develop that political willpower before we ask people to pay for infrastructure because that infrastructure will frankly, it will suck if we don't have that political willpower. So let's develop the willpower to do cheap and effective bicycle projects. I have seen no evidence from any staff that they think you're at all serious about that, but I know I've heard several of you talk about that. Anyways, fund the bus, thank you very much. Next thank is, you. Next is Quentin Deppert and they are unmuted. You'll have five minutes, please go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Quentin Deppert. Uh, I'm an IU student here and also a, a townie. And um, so you talk about energy conservation. Um, you've mentioned that. I don't know what that means. Uh, does it mean weatherizing municipal buildings? Um, does it mean providing loans? for people in the city to weatherize their homes so that we're conserving more energy as a city. Um, I would really like to see what that's even um, supposed to mean because if we're only really conserving energy in like our municipal buildings, I don't really see how um, that's really an equitable use of the LIT. You know, that money then isn't, you know, how does that benefit a low income person? It doesn't. Um, and on the topic of public transportation, um, you talked about how right now um, a lot less people are riding the buses, uh, you know, uh, BT's needs are met. Um, that's fine that it's met right now, but, um, you know, in about a year, hopefully, you know, classes are back in person. And um, when I would ride the buses last year, they were always full every single time I got on the bus, it was completely full. There, it was impossible to socially distance. I mean, if we're ever going to have in-person classes again, um, you know, kids are gonna need to get to those classes using the bus. And in order to actually do that in a way that's, you know, safe, um, pres presumably there was, will still be a virus. The only way to do that is to have more buses. Um, I know people who, would like to rely on the bus right now. And um, they're afraid to, because they remember how full those buses were. Um, these students really need, we want more buses. Uh, we're not anti-bus. And Bloomington doesn't really have like the parking infrastructure to support uh, students all having their own cars. And you talk about biking, biking infrastructure, but we don't really have good biking infrastructure right now. I mean, I ride my bike to IU every day and there's potholes in the bike lanes. It's, it's a mess. Um, uh, so I would like to see more funding for public transportation. And I would really like to just see an uh, elaboration of whatever uh, energy conservation is supposed to mean. And if it does mean weatherization, you know, um, make sure that you're weatherizing homes for lower income people. I think that would be a fantastic way to lower their costs and to just, you know, help them live more comfortably. I'm sure there's plenty of people who would love that. Um, thank you very much, that's all I have to say. Thank you. We go to the next speaker. Next is Alex Goodlad and they should be unmuted. You'll have five minutes. Hello. Um, so, um, oh, okay, is, is this timer running down? Okay, it is. It is. Um, awesome. So, um, where, where do I start? Um, I guess, uh, so I'm, I, I have not too much familiarity, but, you know, enough familiarity with uh, the city budget 
um, and uh, what's needed. And I, I mean, I, I, I want to like this proposal is, is what I'm getting at because, um, be, because there, there needs to be a bigger um, chunk of the pie to um, properly invest in the city. Um, that, that's as far as where I agree with uh, the mayor. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we really owe it to the community, especially those that are underserved to, um, kind of listen to where they're struggling. And, um, I kind of say that with, um, the caveat that, um, th there's, there's a lot of anti-tax arguments in the discussion. And, 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 and I think that, um, I, I don't quite buy the notion that um, that the tax itself, the you know twenty five dollars per ten k, is going to be responsible for doom and gloom if if it's imposed. But it's important that if if we're going to increase the tax and then put new money and in, invest new money, that should be in the right place. And um, you've you've heard it from a lot of um, people who you know, or um, climate activists and, and, and people who know what they're talking about, Quinn Deppard and uh, Oana um, Stonebreaker and, and et cetera. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and their words are important that um, they're really not um, too, um, too impressed by, uh, by what's, um, by what's being by what's being proposed, and in particular, um, there's just not a plan, and and there's and 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 not enough of a plan, um, and not enough transparency to the community. I know that um, there's an ordinance now being considered, and and I want to address the ordinance that's supposed to bring more transparency because I, I don't think that's been discussed yet, and and then I'll um, I, I think you get my point that I've said earlier, which is to, um, which is to, which is, it's, I got a second what Quentin said and others have said that it's got to go towards mass transit. Even if it's not a thing now, it has to be invested later for the future. Cause, cause we know mass transit is going to fill up back right up eventually, and it's going to be needed. So invest like now, um, <laughs> and, uh, whatever way you can. Um, but with, with this ordinance, um, the, the, the problem with it is that, it, yeah, it brings the committee and you have three people in the community and uh, all recorded meetings and, and recommendations, and that's great and all. But the mayor can uh, say no to those recommendations if, if you look at the um, ordinance closely. Um, it, it, it kind of says in beautiful language that the mayor will um, generally kind of accept the recommendations, but has the freedom to just say no and all he has to do is write a reason to say no. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I think that we, we need, the, the community needs more input. And I think if we wait on it and we, we, we do something and take more time and get, you know, the county government and all these institutions that are, that are on the same page with the needs of the city and the county to, um, to agree. I think that's the approach further. And, uh, based on what we have now. I, I wish that the mayor, um, when he proposed this, he, he, he didn't wait until January to talk about the tax and then just changed it a bunch. And, uh, and now it's not even what it originally was. Like, I, I think we need more time to plan it and bring the community into it next time. And I'll yield. Thank you. Who's the next speaker, please? The next speaker is a written statement uh, from Dave Askins that I will read. If you give me one moment, please. Mm -hmm. Actually, while I pull that up, I'm going to um, allow the next speaker to speak, and that would be uh, Daniel Bingham, and they should be unmuted. You'll have five minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, my name's Daniel Bingham. Uh, when the LIT was first reproposed, I mean, first off, 
I was definitely in favor of the original 0.5% proposal. In fact, I thought it needed to be the full amount that we can raise it to 1.25%. And present, I presented a plan for what we could do with that money to address carbon emissions. Um, after the pandemic hit, after the, the economy crashed, I assumed that was off the table. Um, and when the 0.25% was first reopposed, my gut instinct was we should wait on this for at least another year because people are hurting and we should let them recover. The more I sat with that and thought about that and read about what is happening with climate and the more I realized that this pandemic is, the, is climate collapse, this is part of it, we're already in it. The more I realized that there isn't going to be a better time things aren't going to get better. Yes, we will get a vaccine for this pandemic. Yes, we might start a recovery, economic recovery, but it won't last. There are going to be rolling shocks that's, that are gonna come with increasing frequency. And they're already coming faster than our worst expectations. They're already accelerating far worse than we predicted, worse than the expectations that the IPCC based their call to cut carbon emissions by half by 2030. They gave us a deadline and what we are experiencing is already coming faster and worse than they predicted when they set that deadline. So there isn't going to be a better time. We have to do multiple things at once. We have to do our utmost to take care of people who are hurting while also cutting carbon emissions and restructuring society drastically. We don't have a whole lot of money to work with. I, I don't buy the argument that we have to pass this tax now or we might not get the chance. I think if that if the state legislature does that, we work around that in other ways. Um, but I do think we do need to raise funds in order to fund climate changes. That said, this plan that was presented tonight in the mayor's slides, and I wish those had been posted ahead of time so I could reference them, but this plan does not address carbon emissions adequately or even come close. It makes some vague gestures in that direction. It pays some lip service to it, but it is far more about economic development, arts, social services than it is about climate. Again, I do believe we need to do multiple things at once, but every if, if this is really about addressing climate change, and again, if we don't do this, Things are just gonna keep getting worse. More people and more people are gonna get hurt and they're, it's, it's gonna keep accelerating. So we have to be addressing climate change first and foremost. Every aspect of that plan, every dollar needs to go towards cutting carbon emissions somewhere. I did the math on what it will take for us as a city to hit the IPCC's targets. And we are facing, an, it's gonna take an overwhelming amount of money, more than we have, frankly, which means the pittance that's in this plan, it, every dollar needs to be making progress. You can do both. The things that have already been mentioned, transit, like this pandemic will pass, we will get a vaccine eventually, and transit will once again be really a really important part of our transportation infrastructure. Um, transit helps low-income people and directly cuts carbon emissions. Weatherization helps low-income people, directly cuts carbon emissions. You can structure a solar energy program that would prioritize low-income people and help cut their utility bills and directly cut carbon emissions. Uh, you can prioritize housing that is dense, that helps cut housing costs while also building the community we need to be low carbon. You can prioritize bike infrastructure, which is much cheaper to get around on than cars, and that helps low-income people. And we can look for other ways in addition, but every dollar spent needs to be directly cutting carbon emissions. And I know for a lot of people that this is a hard ask and it's hard to wrap your head around the idea that this pandemic could be related to climate. I just listened to a radio lab episode yesterday about new research, a new fungus showed up in hospitals all across the world out of nowhere, all of a sudden, and it was infecting people and it was killing them. And they linked it directly to climate change because of increasing temperatures and because of habitat loss, the fungus had evolved so that our natural body heat, which was our previous protection against it, no longer worked. It could live in our That's body. That's your time, Mr. Bingham. Be able to. 
we're going to be facing more of this if we don't act. Thank you. Uh, let's, who is the next speaker, Ms. McDowell? Next is the um, statement submitted by Dave Askins, and I will read that now. Dave Askins. Please go ahead. Dave Askins with the B Square Beacon. This is a question with a long wind up. The ordinance authored by Matt Flaherty that's been added to the agenda looks like it intends to create a new group that's supposed to be a kind of parallel to the Food and Beverage Tax Advisory Commission, FABTAC. The statute for FABTAC reads, quote, the county or city legislative body may not adopt any ordinance or re resolution requiring the expenditure of food and beverage tax collected under this chapter without the approval in writing of a majority of the members of the advisory commission. If you compare that to the language in the ordinance that is supposed to be first read, it mirrors that language exactly. A key difference is that FABTAC is a creature of the state. So it's the state legislature that is constraining the city council's authority, which we're accustomed to having it do. For this ordinance to be first read tonight, it's the city council that would be in some sense constraining its own authority or even ceding its authority to third party. To get a sense of how dramatic this could be, consider this scenario. The mayor, eight council members, it would be six non-members and two members on the new commission, could want to approve an ordinance requiring expenditure of funds. But if one council member on the commission and the three citizens on the commission said, no, it couldn't happen, that's why creating this new commission effectively cedes the authority to approve this kind of ordinance to a third party. It's one thing for the state legislature to constrain a city council's authority. It's quite another thing for a city council to give this authority away. My question. Has this issue been reviewed with respect to the same question of constitutional law that is going to be argued in front of the Indiana Supreme Court on September 24th as a part of the case known as City of Bloomington Board of Zoning Appeals versus UJ-80 Corporation and transmission? And the Thank next, you. The next uh, speaker is Joseph. Wainia, and they should be unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Joseph Winia, and I just wanted to first thank Mayor Hamilton and the council for holding this special session, and also preface my comment by saying that I am a new resident to the city and new to city politics. But that said, I still just wanted to express um, my support for the lit and also echo in general Mr. Bingham's remarks um, and also the remark that was um, made by Council Member Rolo underscoring the urgency for the need for action, and particularly with respect to the climate and that the cost of inaction will be far greater than the cost of what's being proposed now. And I just also wanted to underscore my personal interest in seeing as much of the funds as possible being applied to climate specific actions. Um, because I think that those are going to have an even greater economic impact in the very near term than just addressing the current economic uh, COVID-related cases. And also wanted to just reiterate that uh, Mayor Hamilton's illustration of the city's income tax rate on a global scale makes it seem clear to me that even this proposed income tax is well within a reasonable bounds, um, especially for such a necessary application. So just wanted to express that and say thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. The next speaker is Natalia Galvin and they are unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Natalia Galvin and I live in District 1. Uh, this lit was originally proposed as a climate lit in January. As a Bloomington volunteer and organizer for the past couple of years, uh, never before have I seen a movement that is so multi-generational as with my work uh, with climate change, whether watching hundreds of K through 12 students march through Dun Meadow or come out to organizing meetings at Harmony. Uh, these young Bloomington residents know that we are in a climate emergency and they will likely be impacted most. Uh, to echo what Daniel said, as a community member and organizer, I'm happy to see um, 
I'm happy to see our conversation kind of go back to climate with this. I'm happy to see the ordinance 2016 being proposed in conjunction with the lit. This ordinance combined with the lit addresses the critical need for collaboration between the mayor, city council and community members. We are in a climate emergency and we need to address the social, economic and racial injustice, so racial justice and equities now, this can't wait. Um, I urge council to support both the ordinance and the lit if it is climate minded and better fleshed out with council input. We need your council leadership on this. Thank you. At this time, there are no other raised hands. Uh, Mr. Lucas, is has anyone contacted you? I don't have any additional uh, written comments from folks. Oh, I apologize. Uh, someone has just um, written a question and I will read it now. Okay. If it is appropriate. Yes, please go ahead. This is from Emily Ernsberger from the HT. Um, she indicates that she has a question that she would like to read. Um, she also says, while the report says the tax would generate $4 million annually for the county, how much of that would be distributed to the city? Okay, thank you. Members may take up uh, questions asked by members of the public uh, if they so choose in their follow-up questions after public comment. Uh, last call for public comment on resolution 2013. Final call. Uh, hearing nothing from the clerk, we will come back to the council for a follow-up round of questions. Are there members with questions? I see council member Rallo followed by council member Sandberg. Mr. Rallo, go ahead. Thank you, President Volan. I wondered if we could have, if she's prepared to have Corporation Counsel uh, Guthrie, uh, if, she, if she could respond to uh, Mr. Askin's inquiry about seating <clears throat> authority of the council uh, sure. relative to that ordinance, I'd, proposed ordinance. Uh, point of order for the council. I, I'd like to suggest that ordinance 20. Uh, 16 is on the agenda tonight for first reading. Um, typically, there's no debate or discussion of that item um, uh, upon first reading. Um, it's certainly a, a worthy question, um, but unless the council wants to suspend the rules to debate that word. No, let, let me withdraw that. Let me withdraw that question. You're, you're, you're quite correct. I'm sorry. Um, my question, my other question was uh, to Controller Underwood, um, if he's still present. And that is that this is an economic development lit. Is it in terms of the capital uh, plan, is it limited to, uh, is, is transportation uh, not an option for an economic development lit? Uh, I believe it is. And I think Philippa could talk to that more than I, reality of uh, transportation uses. Public transportation. Yeah, she wants to jump in on that. Yes, it is. It, 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 it is, is allowable. It is an allowable. It's allowable. Use. So, yeah. so we could use it in the in. We could use it for that. Good to know. Yes. Thank you. All right, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we go to Council Member uh, Sandberg. Thank you. And I would just want to follow up with the question from Emily Ernstberger with respect to her question about um, how the $4 million will be allocated uh, amongst the units. Uh, the four units, it will it be distributed on the same basis as the, the public safety lit so that the, the county would get approximately uh, the same amount as us, just slightly less than that. So their, their share would be um, a little over $4 million and the rest would go to the town of Ellettsville and um, town of Steinsville. Okay, and I hope that answers Ms. Ernstberger's question. Thank you. Just to clarify, yeah, Council Member, I think, I think that um, the point is that, uh, I think Ms. Ernstberger's question implied that the total amount raised by the tax would be 4 million, it's not correct. It would be over 8 million, four of which would go to the city and four of which would go to the county roughly is that not correct 
That's correct. It'd be, it's about $8.7 million total. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, further second, further follow-up questions? Looking for raised hands. Councilmember Piedmont Smith and then Councilmember Smith. Yes, thank you. I wanted to follow up on uh, Ms. Stonebreaker's question as to why uh, this proposal is uh, proposed as an economic development lit increase rather than a certified shared increase. I guess that would go to Mr. Underwood or Ms. Guthrie, I don't know. Um, or the mayor. <laughs> I'm happy to take that too, if you want, or yes, yeah, go ahead. step in. Uh, really, it, it's it's been proposed as meeting the needs that we've identified um, to bring in the revenue that we need to to address the needs that we have and that fit the economic development proposal. It's been that way from the beginning. If other jurisdictions want to propose a different approach or a different tax, that's fine. But we haven't really heard that, and um, it was designed to bring in the revenues uh, for the city that we felt were appropriate to use. And could you um, could you speak to uh, is there a difference in approach if the city or if the Monroe County Income Tax Council wanted to um, increase the amount that went that was distributed through certified shares? Is that a different is there a different path to that? And does that factor into your decision to put it through as an edit? I don't think it's a different path, but I, I better be careful and see if Ms. Guthrie has, a, or, or Mr. Underwood, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's a significantly different path. No, all of the uh, tax rates that you can pass under the lit go through the same process um, of voting, et cetera. Does okay. that answer your question? Yes, yes. So uh, the, the economic development path was chosen because the city could identify specific needs and did not hear from other units about additional needs to add. I don't know, I still don't quite understand why it was chosen to go the economic development route. I think what the mayor was saying was that uh, the, the biggest need that he saw for this right now was um, creation of jobs, the economy, uh, and climate change, which actually is intricately uh, um, involved with our economy and it's uh, gonna be really important. Um, you know, I think one of the other things is that, that we can put this in a separate fund and it's, it's more transparent that way. You can see where exactly where the expenditures are going. Um, uh, so that was, I think, another consideration. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Can I ask a question? Uh, proce you can. A procedural question. Yes, uh, please. Can I just ask the council at, to uh, a question? Can I just uh, ask the our mem hmm? uh, the other councilors a question? Uh, well. I'm not sure what the question. <laughs> Do you want me just to just ask, ask it, and, and then you can tell? Okay, so so a, 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 several constituents that I've talked to and been in contact with um, don't think we've had enough time to sit with this, so that they have been able to uh, let it percolate a little bit, and for them to um, give us their opinion. Or, or to feel like they understand it. Do, does, does anybody want to comment on how they feel about that? It makes me feel a little uneasy. Um, do you all, what do you all think about that? I'd like to start addressing that because this was a matter that uh, complicated the issue for me from the very beginning. Uh, the way that this has been scheduled is uh, a result of the 
of hard points in the schedule that we couldn't control. First of all, as you know, we were not even doing business uh, for uh, doing anything but essential business uh, for several months. Um, secondly, um, the process for uh, properly enacting this tax, uh, I believed required that we give the other units a full 30 days to take up the issue, uh, which means that they would have to receive the issue by October 1 or 2. Uh, it also requires the auditor, the county auditor, to receive the resolution that we would pass uh, with at least 10 days notice so that they could advertise it, uh, bringing the, uh, the hard date for it to be able to be adopted with a January 1 effect date of September 17th, give or take a day. So in other words, uh, September 16th next week is the latest possible uh, time that the council could, uh, could adopt this resolution while still giving the other units time to consider it. Now, if the council, in f if, if there are in fact enough votes to adopt uh, the, this resolution without needing the votes of other members of the tax council, uh, that uh, I have since learned that uh, this resolution could be adopted later than September 16th. But, uh, you know, if there is a need for, uh, if, if, for example, seven members adopt it, uh, according to statute, it would be less than 50%, and at least one member of the county council or some combination of county and eligible counselors would have to uh, vote in favor to adopt it, and they would then need enough time by statute to do so. So I tried to err on the side of caution, and I scheduled it uh, with maximum opportunity for everyone to consider it. Now, uh, I, I don't know uh, whether this is true or not, but I believe that if, uh, Council indicates that there are uh, not enough votes to adopt it, eight votes um, at this time, but the administration believes that uh, there may be eight votes able to be gotten between now and October 30th. Uh, it's possible that it could be adopted um, because effectively a majority of city council members who are make up the tax council could uh, adopt it without input from other units. But, um, that would uh, preclude the ability to go to other units in order to get their actual vote. So I know it's a very complicated answer, but I just wanted people to understand why I scheduled it the way I did. Uh, I felt like I didn't have a choice, but I think that there are some limited choices to be made here. Well, what, and Steve, it wasn't meant to be any criticism of you. Oh, I know. It just, it just oh, I know. I is know. kind of like a little, making me uncomfortable. So. Oh, I don't blame you. And I, I just wanted to make sure that people understood that uh, this was not necessarily the administration uh, browbeating me to, to do so. I, I chose this schedule because I thought it would maximize uh, the fairness of the process. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just wanted people to fully understand it. And I'm happy to be corrected by Mr. Lucas um, or by uh, uh, City Legal on this topic, but I think I have it understood. And uh, I just want people to know that there is theoretically a possibility after September 16th, but there are some greater consequences that await us if so. It's a point of order. Uh, are we in council question uh, for- We are still in council staff, questions in and I- Is it sort of a- We're still in council questions and I, I felt that that uh, procedural question needed to be answered. So okay. my apology for taking some okay. time on it. Thank you. And I, I, I do want to correct maybe a few things that Councilmember Volan stated. Please do. Please do. Point of order. Good take it, Mr. <laughs> Lucas. I think this might be relevant. So um, the uh, city council is a member of the tax council. So the resolution uh, before you tonight would propose an ordinance to the uh, Monroe County Tax Council and cast some number of votes, uh, you know, potentially in favor of that ordinance. Um, after the council acts to propose that ordinance, it would send that uh, piece of legislation to the county auditor, who then has up to 10 days to distribute that uh, ordinance to the other tax council members. 
uh, the auditor doesn't have to take that full 10 days, um, but that's what statute says the auditor is allowed. Um, after the other tax council members receive that ordinance, uh, they then have 30 days to, to, uh, to consider that and, and act on that. Um, again, they don't have to take the full 30 days, but I believe before any of those other members could act on a proposal put, put forward to them by, uh, by the city council, they would have to uh, advertise a public hearing 10 days in advance um, of whenever they're going to consider that proposal. So um, uh, I believe Councilmember Volan was right that the, uh, the, if, if the city council, um, let me think of how to say this, uh, if a majority of the tax council's votes aren't cast by the city council, that is to say that less than eight members of the city council support this ordinance, uh, for, the, uh, for the ordinance to pass the tax council, some other uh, member would need to vote in support. And so the timeline um, council member Volan spelled out allows them uh, to act in support if they want to uh, with um, the full amount of time that statute allows. Um, I, um, it, it's true that if the um, city council were to uh, postpone the vote later than next week, um, there could still be a majority of the tax council uh, within the city council that votes to support it. So if eight or nine city council members vote to support this, um, they could act up until the end of October um, to impose this tax. But the timeline, as, as council member Volan spelled out, allows for action by the other members if they wanted to, um, if there was a need for support from the other members and if they wanted to support the ordinance. I don't know if the mayor has anything additional to add. Mr. Lucas has certainly said it better than I could. I appreciate the clarification. Mr. Yeah. Mayor, do you have a, a follow-up? Very briefly, I would just say, look, we, we have worked very closely, our council and your council, I think very well, to be very careful, to be sure in this very detailed process that we follow every timing demand and give everybody the full opportunity so that there's not somebody who for whatever reason later can say, well, we didn't get our full 30 days, even if we couldn't have changed it, we, it was important for us. We, we just wanted to follow very carefully the state statute and the state timing. Uh, and I think that's the right thing to, to do uh, and encourage you to do so, so that we don't encourage or allow later challenges. It's a very specific, uh, time time demands, and we, we think that's the right way to proceed. Thank you. Yes, that also dovetails with what I understand. So I hope that clarifies for everyone uh, what is happening here, um, what you know, and why we're on the schedule that we are. Uh, but the council does have choices that it can make. It's not uh, limited to the schedule as I've made it. Uh, are there further questions from members? Uh, I don't see any hands raised. I have a question. Um, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I actually had a technical question uh, about the text of the um, resolution, um, specifically the text of the ordinance proposed by the resolution. Um, in item five, it says, uh, for further avoidance of doubt, no other change in the ordinance adopted in 2019 is intended or authorized. What ordinance adopted in 2019 does that refer to? I believe that would have been the lit, that any lit that was passed last year. So probably, I'm guessing the PS lit maybe, which is part of the lit. So in other words, all we are doing here is requesting an edit or proposing an edit rate. All the other rates in there stay the same. And, and so there, was, there was a rate change in 2019. For PSAP? I think it was PSAP, yeah. Okay, thank you. Further questions from members before we go to debate? Seeing none, we will now uh, go to debate. I want to once again remind everyone that uh, a vote tonight uh, is, I mean, the, the advertised public meeting is next week. 
So uh, we basically, it will be futile to hold a vote tonight. Uh, I can certainly suggest, and I'm sure members will avail themselves of the ability to indicate their current leaning. Uh, there's no reason why you can't say how you would vote, but we will not be taking a vote tonight. Uh, I'll be entertaining a motion to postpone it to uh, the second reading on the 16th. With that, uh, you'll have five minutes each for each round. Mr. Rallo, I see your hand first. Thank you, President Volan. Um, <clears throat> I think the mayor laid out a very uh, good argument uh, and I appreciate the, the context. Uh, first, I'd like to just say that with this very modest tax increase, we still remain very low relative to other counties that surround us and low relative to other counties in the state. Um, I think it's clear that we're going to experience continued shortfalls in revenue. It's also clear that we have virtually no recourses. This is one that's available to us. And so it seems prudent to, to take that. I think that we do have a, an urgency uh, related to this that we should act sooner. Um, there, are there things that uh, give me pause? Yes. Um, I think a number of people, um, Mr. Paul, for instance, talked about the regressive nature of the tax, but that is um, just the, uh, a function of, of the tax itself and the structure. We don't have control over that. But as he also referenced, and I think we should be aware of that a significant portion of this goes to vulnerable members of our community. And so, and we went toward uh, job development, economic development. It also goes toward uh, accessible transportation, alternative transportation. Uh, it's focused uh, to a significant degree on climate action. Uh, I think I, I'm very conscious of Mr. Bingham's uh, plea that uh, we ought to get the most bang for the buck. However, I'm, I, I don't think I would support it if there wasn't a significant contribution towards social services to offset um, the, the regressive nature of it by, by design. Um, I think we need to maintain our commitment to climate uh, and we're going to stall unless we have um, some form of revenue. Um, so I think that this is a very uh, bold and, and prudent step that the mayor is taking. I know it isn't easy. Uh, and I give uh, he and his administration credit for moving forward on this. Uh, it's anticipating the future. I think that we will be in a better position in the future if we were to adopt this. And so I'll indicate that I will support it this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another member who would like to speak to this issue? I see, I'm having trouble seeing. So if, Mr. Sims, if you could see who else is raising their hand. Council Member Scambolari. I see Council Member Scambolari. You'll have five minutes. Thank you, I probably won't need that. Um, <coughs> I appreciate all the work and thought that has gone into this proposal. Um, something that is not com not particularly compelling to me was the chart that said that 50% of the tax revenue would come from people making $100,000 or more. Um, first of all, I think just basic arithmetic would suggest that would be the case. Um, but I don't know that that's a lot of consolation if you've lost your job in recent months and you've had to raise your savings um, and you're faced with losing secure housing. So um, I guess it doesn't matter to me who will be paying 
more in terms of total revenue. What I keep coming back to is the impact on individual households. So I think about that a lot. Um, and if we were to vote tonight, I would likely abstain because I do want to think about this some more. Um, but one request I do have, a lot of the elements of the plan uh, or the draft plan, I should say, are really dependent. If we were to pull them off, it would really depend on the partnerships we build. Um, so Centerstone is just one organization that's specifically mentioned, but over the next five years, we've talked about one and a quarter million dollars in services for those experiencing homelessness. We've talked about 1.8 million over five years for job supports. Um, I would love to hear from some of those partners um, during public comment or in whatever setting is appropriate. Um, because I think whether or not this works at all will depend heavily on what they bring to the table and their degree of enthusiasm uh, and their, their feedback on whether or not these ideas are well-founded. Um, so I would just extend that invitation, extend that request um, as this conversation goes forward. I'd love to hear for some of the partners that would be involved in the proposed initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. So there's another member who would like to speak to resolution 2013. I'm looking for raised hands. I see Councilmember Flaherty. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I appreciate again the the work and the detail that the administration has put into developing this proposal, um, which of course has been a longer conversation. I think um, uh, there's no easy or right way to talk about uh, how to pursue bold new initiatives and and adjust tax rates. When we were talking about this in the spring, um, a criticism we heard from uh, a number of people was this process is too long. Uh, how many meetings do we have to go to? Uh, and and now it's you know the opposite. Um, there's I, maybe there's a happy medium in there somewhere, um, but it's it's uh, I, the timing is important. I think um, the mayor is absolutely right that after this year we may lose any input of the city on, on a local income tax uh, proposal at all. Um, and our county colleagues, um, you know, despite six of seven of them being Democrats and uh, caring about issues like climate change um, and, and tackling sustainability and equitable investments in our community are, are, are seeming to be a very anti-tax body. Um, and this isn't just a COVID thing. This was true before COVID as well, um, which begs like some interesting questions about local income taxes. Of course, it's unfortunate that, it, that it's a flat tax, which affects people in a regressive way. All of us wish that was different. It'd be great if the state would change it. I would also support the changes to give cities a separate taxing authority than counties. Um, but as the mayor mentioned, we've been trying for this for 15 years and, and with no luck. Um, so we'll keep trying. That's, that's great. And I appreciate that, that our county colleagues want to try that too. Uh, but you know, what's, what's so correct about our current local income tax rate? It, we know it's among the lowest. Um, in our contiguous counties and in the region and around the state, uh, but why 1.345%? Why was the public safety lit okay? Why don't we cut that tax rate in half now and put money back in people's pockets? You know, uh, Why not cut it to next to nothing? We can cut city services like crazy. I mean, this is all some, there's some level of status quo bias here to say that the current tax rate is the right tax rate. There's no reason that's so. Um, and it, at the end of the day, it, it comes down to some, some level of, uh, do you believe in the power of government to use taxes to collectively serve the greater good of people? And because no tax we, we raise, local income tax or otherwise, can directly benefit every individual who is taxed, um, especially low income individuals, more, every single one of them, more than the tax they pay in. That's just an impossibility. That's not, not how taxes work. But Generally speaking, I, I, I am a believer in, in government doing good things for the greater good and the public good uh, with, with its tax revenues. I think that's an important um, concept to keep in mind here. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, I don't, I'm not particularly well structured in my, in my comments tonight, but um, I think Daniel Bingham made some really good points and I, and I share his view. This is, you know, there's elements of this we simply can't 
weight on. We are in the midst of a climate emergency and that is going to affect people of color and low income communities and other, um, other groups that have been marginalized by our current systems in various ways. Um, and, and we need to work on those. We need, we need a just and equitable uh, sustainable economic development solution. And that's what this tax is meant to do. It's economic development, you know, for our community and, and our defined goals and our comprehensive plan, our sustainability action plan, transportation plan, that, that's what we mean by economic development here in Bloomington, a sustainable and equitable place and economy for everyone. Um, so that's what we're trying to do here. I do think we need uh, to address concerns of, of folks that have been voiced in the spring as well as now. Um, Namely, that there's been people that support this in principle, but have, have had, had a hard time getting on board with the proposal um, as such. And, and the main concerns I've heard are related to uh, transparency, reporting of, of outcomes and the effectiveness of policies, as well as um, uh, decision making and how and how that process goes, you know, and having meaningful public involvement in that and having involvement from multiple elected officials, including council members in that. And, that's what I was trying to get at with Ordinance 2016, which we'll introduce tonight and discuss, you know, next week. And I look forward to feedback from, you know, the administration and, and working uh, on any possible amendments to that that are needed in the coming week as well. Um, but I think to me, that's a really important point is to have a collaborative and balanced approach to, to how we're making these decisions that kind of sets some guidelines and better defines what this process would look like going forward. Um, so all that said, I, I lean towards supporting this, but I think uh, the issues raised in, in 2016 are really important to me and, I, and I'd like to see them be part of our uh, approach here. Thanks. Thank you. Any other member who would like to speak to resolution 2013? First call, council member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I don't have a lot to say at this point because I'm undecided, um, still thinking about what uh, what will be best for our community, both at this time and in the long run. Um, I did want to point out, however, uh, because some of my colleagues as well as the mayor have emphasized that uh, Bloomington has a low tax rate and would continue to have a low tax rate, uh, even if this uh, lit increase were adopted. We also have a very high cost of living. We have the highest housing prices in the state of Indiana. So let's not lose sight of that. <laughs> it costs a hell of a lot more to live here than it does to live in Morgan County or in Brown County or those other counties that we're comparing ourselves to. Um, so uh, I'm just going to be, you know, thinking and, and talking to people and considering uh, both sides of this issue in the, in the coming week. I do wish we had more time, uh, both for the public uh, and for uh, council members and for our county colleagues to digest this, but I understand um, that there are real concerns about the General Assembly uh, removing our ability to, to act at all uh, if we wait too long. So uh, that's all I've got for tonight, thank you. Thank you. Further comments from my colleagues on resolution 2013 from those who have not yet spoken. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, President Volan. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, there's several things that go go on in my in my thinking. Um, one of them is um, three or four people, I, I did a poll on next door. So three or four people are against the tax for various reasons. Um, so, that, so that's in my mind uh, and weighing on, on me. Um, I see that um, the other is a question in my mind, is this proposal a response to the current health and economic crisis. If, if it is, then I believe there are certain things that are listed in the, uh, the list of uh, initiatives that I, I just can't see that it's necessary when you're talking about a health and economic crisis. And 
um, one that jumped out at me was, so I see there's a million point two each year for improving bicycle lanes. And what's terrible about that is that I love bicycle lanes. I think it's great. Every week I ride my bike. I love it. But, but, is, but if we are talking about a health and economic crisis in our response to it, then I, I'm sorry, I just, I, I don't think I can support the proposal. Um, and there are, there are a few other things in there, but the, I, I find that I, I have a hard time feeling solid on what the proposal is addressing. So, um, so I just, I just wanted to articulate that and tell you that, and to let the public know, those are, those are the kind of things that are going through my mind, listening to their comments and looking at the proposal. And, um, you know, if I was voting tonight, I would abstain as well so that, uh, I could do more research and gather more information. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Other other first round comments in this debate period. I'm seeing some frozen screens. So if somebody sees a hand raised, Mr. Sims, could you note it? Um, there are none. I'm sorry, Councilmember. I have Rosenbar. my hand up. I I it's just okay. saw. It. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenberg. Yeah, okay, I'm, thank you. Appreciate that. I can also Please just go ahead. Tell, tell folks that my hand up. I'll be brief. I would say yeah. I'm leaning in support of this. Am I muted? I'm okay. I'm leaning in support of this tax, just as I did in the beginning of the year when we started it as a climate climate tax. Um, I would say my major concern, as it was then, is the transparency and the accountability and the focus on how we're going to spend the funds. So I think having a larger conversation about that as we move forward is really important to me. Um, I'm just looking at my notes. I mean, I, I know I, I know it's hard taking money from folks at this difficult time with a pandemic, but I think, I think over the course of a year, this tax is so very small that like the, the good we can do outweighs, outweighs that part of it. Um, so I think that's about it, honestly, for right now. I'm leaning towards supporting this. I just want to make sure we put in place a good mechanism to check this every year because it is the taxpayer dollars and we're taking their dollars at a really difficult time. So I want to make sure we put it towards what we say we're going to do, economic justice, racial justice, right, sustainability and environmental justice. Thanks. Thank you. Are there, I see Councilmember Sandberg. Go ahead. If we were to vote tonight, I would be a definite abstention. And I, uh, for those of you who are well, well acquainted with my way of thinking and my pragmatic approach to things, you know that I uh, don't make decisions lightly and I listen before I speak and before I make decisions as important as this. One of the things mentioned, uh, <laughs> Um, is the very important issue of partnerships. And I think at the very heart of some of my reservations here is the lack of our ability to work with our county colleagues and come up with a strategy for how do we address the Indiana General Assembly. We all know what they're capable of doing. We all know that Bloomington is sometimes this, uh, this target that they like to, when they see us starting to make a move in some sort of direction, uh, they'll make an end run and come around and, and, and make sure that we're not able to do it. We've experienced this. But my thinking as, as a strategist is how do we overcome some of these obstacles and some of these barriers to us as a city entity being able to do what we would want to do on behalf of raising taxes to an adequate level where we can fund the kind of things that we as a community want to fund. Um, I am not an anti-taxer. 
um, that has been raised as, you know, taxes being the third rail. Um, nobody wants to have their taxes raised. And, and if you believe in government, as I do, we cannot run a healthy, strong government without strong tax dollars. My concern about this particular proposal has to do with its timing. It has changed from January when the initial proposal was meant, and a lot of that is largely due to unforeseen um, issues that we all are aware, aware of that have cropped up since then and now. But to me, this is almost too large of a project. It's too much of a kitchen sink approach. And it's very, very hard to take this message out to the constituents. We're all getting calls. We're all getting emails. We're all attending you know, meetings where people are questioning us. What is this money going to be used for? That was the concern from the very beginning. Hey, I don't have a problem with my taxes being raised slightly. Uh, and again, these may be middle to upper income people that, that responded in that way. But what's your plan? What are your specifics? How can we be assured that this will be a good, um, a good, you know, feasible plan for going forward that will have the maximum benefit? The other issue I'm having is that we're making decisions that do affect people outside of our jurisdiction. If we were untied to how this is going to impact our colleagues at the county level, I would be less reluctant to lend my support to it tonight. But this is going to impact people uh, beyond us. And yeah, we've got the bully pulpit. We absolutely do. All it takes is eight of us to say yes to this, and it's going to impact people outside of our jurisdiction. That may be something that doesn't concern a lot of people, but it does concern me because just in general, I prefer to work in collaboration with people and not to say, here's what we're going to do, deal with it, when we'll fix it later. I, I really think we're making some errors in judgment here in being so quick to say, yes, we got to do it. The urgency is now. If we don't do it now, we're never going to be able to do it. I'm not quite sure I buy that. I would rather take the time to educate, get more buy-in from the people that this is going to impact, including our county colleagues, and take a little bit more time with this and not, not kind of have this, the sky is falling mentality. Times are gonna get hard, clearly they are. And we have been through tough times before in this city. We've experienced economic downturn and when that happened, we had to tighten our belts. And that's painful. And as somebody who does believe in government and that we need dollars in order to provide good city services, it pains me to have to, to not be for a tax. But I have many reservations. I've made many, many phone calls today. I'm gonna to make many more in the coming week because I'm still undecided. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other first round comments from members who have not yet spoken? Uh, seeing none, I will take an opportunity to speak. If I can just get this thing to reset. Sorry, my uh, timer program has just broken down. Um, I can't stop it for some reason, it's crashed. Is there anyone who would like to speak while I fix this? I'm willing to time you, Council President Boland, if you would like. Would appreciate that. I'll give you a one minute. Okay, please. if you would, thank you. Um, the question came whether this is an appropriate use of economic development funds. We've defined sustainability as a form of economic development. Uh, to my mind, distributing the money as certified shares would simply require even less specificity as to how the money would be used than um, you know, has been uh, complained about. Um, we've heard some of the uh, absurd constraints that our friends in Indianapolis place on cities because they do not value cities and the absurd constraints they have placed on this city in particular. I have seen more than enough from their willingness to arbitrarily curtail our ability to annex at the last minute, to ban our ability to restrict the use of plastic bags, to threaten the entirety of our certified chairs if we did not agree to 
say, allow federal funds to flow to our metropolitan area for I-69, a road project which we did not want, to know that uh, we are uh, at the mercy of the state house. The question came of whether this tax will disproportionately affect the lowest income. An income tax will have no impact on a household that has lost its income. Um, the, uh, the, the complaint from our colleagues on the county council who have written us asking to collaborate, uh, they've also made clear though that they don't support such a tax. About the only point at which I'm sure that the city and the county councils agree is that we should jointly approach the legislature to ask them to not force the city uh, to force this county to raise a tax they don't want. More importantly though, I'd, I'd say that based on the way the state only allows regressive taxes in our case, and doesn't permit us to not drag another jurisdiction into our own affairs, a complaint about this tax being regressive or being uh, 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 compulsive, I'm not sure what the right word is, um, is with the General Assembly, not with the City Council. Because otherwise, when an opportunity arises to fund local government as it should be funded, as it clearly needs to be, after 17 years in this job, I'm a fool to not consider such a tax as, as this uh, seriously. And I wanna commend the mayor for thinking proactively. He's not playing defense. We do need bold thinking, and it is bold indeed to propose a tax under these uh, trying times. The mayor does an increasingly good job of advancing the argument for a tax like this, especially the point about the relative low tax status of this locality and this area, this state, this country, and the world. And contract, contrary to some assertions tonight, uh, the mayor has indeed advanced a plan with specifics. Uh, that's where my uh, uh, sympathy with this proposal uh, reaches its uh, limit. My questions are in some of the specifics. Trail projects, for example, do not seem like something that should merit special spending. Curbside composting doesn't really help apartment dwellers who can't afford homes and places to stash their, their compost or use it. And helping a few people own housing does not help everyone by definition. Meanwhile, had the proposal been a 25 cent increase going entirely to transit, the other half of the mayor's proposal in January, and an idea I favored 12 months ago, I think, I, find, I, I think it would meet with more favor now. In general, I'm leaning toward approving the tax, but I had serious qualms about um, the way in which the mayor has uh, gone about uh, assembling how it would be used, despite the fact that uh, it is more specific than he's been given credit for. I think that uh, the council needs to have uh, more uh, influence in uh, line items within that proposal to be able to move money around. And that's why I suggested uh, such in a question that I asked earlier this evening. A little less um, but I also minute. want to say in closing that um, I do believe that if, uh, uh, if time is an issue um, that uh, would make the difference for people to, for members of my colleagues to support this, um, I, I just don't believe that the 16th is necessarily uh, the deadline for this proposal. Um, I believe that uh, it would be much less reliable to adopt, uh, to attempt to adopt such a tax between the 16th and October 31st, uh, but it is not uh, out of the question. So over the next week, one of the things I'm gonna to try to pin down is, um, you know, to what extent that's a political question, to what extent that's a technical or a bureaucratic question. But uh, your time. otherwise, uh, I am I am leaning towards it. And with that, I invite any other member who's not yet spoken to speak. And I might have my timer. Um, it's crashed here. Um, is there any other member who would like to speak uh, who is uh, whether they've spoken or not? Going once, going twice. With that, uh, I will uh, call for a motion to postpone. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will the clerk please call 
the uh, the role on the motion to postpone to September 16th. Council Member Sims? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. And I believe that's a 9-0 vote. So this issue will be taken up in second reading at the regular session on September 16th. Uh, we now go to the next item on the agenda. Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2016 be introduced and read by title and synopsis only by the city clerk. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll of the motion to introduce? Councilmember Volden? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. <clears throat> Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. All right, uh, the, the yeses have it. Will the clerk please read by title and synopsis? Ordinance 20-16, to establish the Sustainable Development Non-Reverting Fund and to amend Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Administration and Personnel, adding Chapter 2.35 entitled Sustainable Development Fund Advisory Commission. The synopsis is, the ordinance is authored by Council Member Flaherty and creates a dedicated sustainable development fund to receive all monies received by the City of Bloomington from an EDIT rate that have been designated for economic development purposes. The ordinance also amends Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code, Administration and Personnel to create a new seven-member sustainable, sustainable Development Fund Advisory Commission. This commission would, among other duties, prioritize projects to be funded with EDIT revenue, making funding recommendations and report on the use of the fund. Thank you. And with that, I think we conclude our legislation for first reading and resolutions. We go to matters of council schedule. Mr. Lucas, can you fill us in? Uh, nothing major to report. Um, I may put out a plug for the uh, Jack Hopkins uh, Social Services Funding Committee uh, their second round of funding in 2020 just uh, <clears throat> was open for, <clears throat> excuse me, applications uh, today. So any social service agencies that uh, are inter interested in applying can go to the Jack Hopkins website to, uh, to view the uh, details about how to apply for funding. Um, there aren't any uh, additional meetings this week. Uh, the next meeting of the council will be next Wednesday. Uh, which will be the publicly advertised hearing on resolution 2013, which was uh, just discussed tonight. And I have no other items of council schedule. Thank you. With that, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming this evening, uh, for giving input into this very important uh, decision before us. And with that, I'm happy to entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Motion is second. All in favor, please say, say aye. Hi. 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 We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Then thank you. Thank you.